You know, for many years, the existence of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hoven. It's in a field called cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals. The seminar is titled, Dinosaurs and the Bible. Welcome to our third uh, videotape, our session on dinosaurs and the Bible. And we'll just refresh for the folks that haven't been here yet. This is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, all married, and the dog died. I made it. I'm home free. <laughs> it's wonderful. And all three of my kids work for me, and two grandkids, and more coming all the time. This fellow in National Pornographic, uh, Geographic, I mean, says, <clears throat> no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Well now, hold on just a minute. Does he know that or does he think that? He thinks that. There's no way anybody can know that unless they talk to everybody that ever lived. Did he talk to you before he wrote that? Did he talk to Adam and Eve before he wrote that? I doubt it. He says nobody's ever seen. Well, he might believe that, but that's not part of science, folks. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says pretty clearly in Exodus 20, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What do you suppose he meant by that? He wrote that on a rock with his finger. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It looks to me like he's trying to tell us that he made it all in six days, which means Adam must have seen dinosaurs. The Bible says there was no death till Adam sinned. Your textbook says dinosaurs died before man got here. Somebody is seriously wrong. And we're going to discuss today who it is. In the last session, we talked about how what the Garden of Eden was like. The Bible says when God made the world, He said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. There used to be a layer of water above the atmosphere. Some people think it was ice. I don't know if it's solid liquid or gas. I don't know. Water comes in three flavors. But somehow there was water up there. How it was up there, I don't know. The Bible says it was, and I believe that. I think there are some reasonable theories of how it might have been up there. It could have been ice suspended by the magnetic field of the earth. That's one theory. But the Bible says there was water above the firmament. Also, the Bible says most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be under the crust of the earth. If you read Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, He stretched out the earth above the waters. Most of the water that's now on the surface, oceans, used to be in the crust. Big subterranean water chambers. I think when Adam and Eve were here, the world was mostly land and a small percentage of water. Today, it's 70% water and mostly land. And even that land that we have is only 3% habitable for mankind. 3% of the world's surface is habitable for mankind. Most of it's ice caps, deserts, under, underwater. God designed it to be inhabited. What we see today is a junkyard compared to what Adam and Eve saw. So there was water under the crust of the earth. That water that's under, that used to be under the crust came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. So from the creation up until the flood, things were very different. During that time, everything lived over 900 years. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Did you know that Adam spoke every language in the world? Well, there was only one, but he spoke it, okay? Now, <laughs> reptiles never stop growing. It's just a simple biological fact. Reptiles grow all their life. People stop growing. When you're 16 or 18, you're going to quit growing, at least uh, vertically. Some go horizontally afterwards, but reptiles never stop growing. Now, what would happen to a reptile if you put him in the Garden of Eden and let him live to be 900 years old? You'd have a big lizard. A really big lizard. Dinosaurs were giant reptiles that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood. They did not live millions of years ago. They were pre-flood, not prehistoric. So if this is all true, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? They asked Billy Graham, were there dinosaurs on Noah's ark? 
He said, no, apparently not. Noah's Ark did not include dinosaurs because they were extinct before man got here. Oh, Billy, now you got death before sin. I love Billy Graham, praise God for the good he's done, but folks, he's wrong about that one. Dinosaurs on the ark. Man, I hope, hope he kept the woodpeckers in a steel cage of some kind. <laughs> some people say, <clears throat> what do you mean dinosaurs on the ark? They're kind of big, aren't they? Well, the big ones were big, but the little ones were little. <laughs> and Noah was 600 years old when he built that boat. I just bet he was smart enough to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones you can find. Bring two babies. Mm -hmm. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later. Uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark. You bring babies because they're smaller. Uh, duh. You know, the biggest dinosaur egg ever found is smaller than a football. You bring babies because they weigh less. They eat less. They sleep a lot more. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plus, you bring babies because after the flood, they're going to live longer to produce more offspring, and that's why you're bringing them. So it makes common sense to bring babies. Why would you bring big elephants on the ark? Why bring big giraffes? Bring babies. Hello? Plus, you only had to bring two of every sort, not two of every single variety, just two of the basic kinds of animals. He said in Genesis 7, bring them after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. There was the basic kinds of animals, and only those in whose nostrils was the breath of life. And only those on dry land. Noah did not have to bring any fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside. <laughs> he also didn't have to bring any bugs on the ark, because bugs don't have nostrils. They breathe through their skin, through spiracles. Hey, bugs can survive a flood just fine. On floating log mats or floating dead carcasses or something, or burrow in the mud. Go any place where there's been a flood. After the water runs off, walk out into the mud and tell me the first thing you notice. Bugs bite a gazillions, right? Noah brought two of the basic kinds of animals on the ark. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua in his life. <laughs> he just brought generic dogs, like our dog, Nicky. We had Nicky for 12 years before we even knew what kind he was. <laughs> a friend of mine came to my house one day and said, Oh, hey, Brother Hovind, you got a canardly. I said, A what? He said, Your dog, that's a canardly. I said, Really? He said, Yeah, look at it. You can already tell what kind of dog it is. <laughs> How many of you have a full-blooded canardly at home? There we go. <laughs> so just generic animals. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. And it looked like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment. You know, it was a horse kind of animal. So the basic kinds that were on the ark, not every species. Skeptics will say, how did he fit those millions of animals on that little bitty boat? <laughs> now, hold on just a minute. He only brought the land animals. Okay? Bring those with nostrils, no bugs. Bring babies, that's common sense. Bring two of each kind, not every single species or variety. Plus, uh, how many were there? Many experts will tell you there are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. Just basic kinds of animals. Now, I talk pretty fast. I can get going 300 words a minute when I get excited. But did you know if you just talk 60 words per minute, you can name all 8,000 animals in a little over two hours. Some people say, Adam couldn't name all the animals in one day. Are you kidding? You can name them in about an hour. Dog kind, cat kind, hippo kind, giraffe kind, elephant kind. <laughs> Plus, Adam had an IQ of who knows what. I mean, he came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married all first day. <laughs> really smart fella, okay. Plus, uh, how big was the ark? The atheist will say, he couldn't put those animals on the ark. And I say, really, how many were there? They say, we don't know. Oh, well, how big was the ark? They'll say, well, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, I see. Is that the way this works? Yeah. Well, beats what they believe. They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded in the Big Bang and made everything. Mm -hmm. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and a rocky surface was created. Yes, boys and girls, the planet earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what the textbooks teach. And as earth formed, it was like the moon it was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But slowly, rocks absorbed the oxygen. Notice this textbook says, the percentage of oxygen was zero, but the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> I wondered about that when I said, that's a college textbook. Yeah, there was nothing there, but they absorbed it all right. Yeah. 
So the rocks absorbed the oxygen and then it began to rain on the rocks. Oh man, oceans formed as it rained for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. Doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This book says the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So their theory says 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry. Now there's a good trick. <laughs> and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. They asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. They said, you can speak to our students if our professors can ask you any questions they want because we'd like to show to students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> so I got... I got... <laughs> I got... <laughs> I got there and there were six professors and all their students in the room. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, you know. I said, folks, I got my charts out here, and I said, I believe the Bible. The Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood, you know, destroyed the world. Noah saved two of each kind, not every species, just the basic kinds on the ark. Now, since then, there's been a lot, whole lot of varieties produced, you know, big dogs, little dogs, curly hair, straight hair, no question, but just basic kinds on the ark. And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. You got to tell them. You guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. One professor was getting kind of upset about that time. He said, Hoven, do you realize there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world? I said, yes, sir, there's a bunch. He said, do you mean to tell me that all those dogs came from only two dogs on Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> he didn't have any more questions after that. I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this lady came up to me and she said, she was obviously upset. She said, tonight, you said that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, ma'am, just calm down. You're about to blow a gasket, you know. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, okay, then tell me, where did we come from? She said, we came from a macromolecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> it was so cool. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you certainly do. Yeah. I found her life verse saying to a stock, Thou art my father, to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. There's grandpa. Mm -hmm. Yep. I found my daddy's life verse. Lord have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. <laughs> anyway, the Bible says the earth was filled with violence. Everybody was wicked. All flesh had corrupted his way. Everything was corrupt. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. And so Noah said to his boys, Boys, go for wood. we got to build a boat. <laughs> and so they went and got all this wood, and they built this big boat. Now after the flood was over, Noah's son had a son and named him Arphaxad. Why would anybody name a kid Arphaxad? <laughs> Can't you see that kid in kindergarten? What's your name, son? Arphaxad? Do you know how to spell it? No. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> Don't you think one day, little Arphaxad's getting big enough, he's sitting on Grandpa's lap like kids do, and he looks around, he says, Hey, Grandpa, I have a question. How come we're the only people in the whole world? Uh, where is everybody? <laughs> Eventually, that thought's going to cross his mind, and Grandpa's going to tell him the story about the flood. Actually, his daddy's going to live long enough to tell that story to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They lived a long time back there, folks, right after the flood. And today there are 270 surviving flood legends. They're still telling the story about the flood in many cultures that have never heard of the Bible. You know, the Hawaiians uh, had a legend that said, 
The first, after, long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Interesting. One family saved in a giant canoe. That sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a story called the Hiking Classic. It's one of the oldest stories in the world. It says the father of their civilization is a guy named Fu Hai. The story says, Fuhai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. After the flood, they were the only people alive on earth. And they repopulated the world. Well, now that sounds kind of like the Bible story too, doesn't it? The Tolik Indians in Mexico have a legend that says, The first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. 1,716 years. Well, you know, the Bible dates add up to 1656. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. I just suspect maybe even the Atlantis story is another flood legend. As far as the people on the ark were concerned, the whole world sank beneath the waves, you know. Why would there be 270 surviving flood legends today? Oh, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. <laughs> it's not too complicated. If you look at the country of Turkey, on the far right-hand side, there's a mountain called Mount Ararat. On a Turkish map, this is called Noah on Gumshi, which means Noah's big boat. They've got signs. You drive right up to it. This way to Noah's big boat, five kilometers. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. Now, that's interesting. Some of the skeptics will say, Noah, the flood lasted a year. The flood didn't last a year. Noah was in the ark for a year. But parts of the ground probably only underwater for a few weeks or a few months, just long enough to drown everybody. The ark actually hit bottom in the seventh month. Now, why didn't he get out till the thirteenth month? Uh, we cover all that on video number six, all the reasons why he stayed in the ark. But the Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains, plural, mountains of Ararat. The Bible does not say the ark landed on Mount Ararat. It could have, I don't know, but it doesn't say that. There are at least four theories of what happened to Noah's ark. Some people says, say they took it apart and used the lumber for buildings. After all, when Noah got off the ark, how big were the trees outside? About this big, right? Pretty tough to build a house out of. Some people say it rotted, it fell apart, it's gone. Could be. Some people say it's still on the mountain. And they're always going over there looking for it. And they always come back and say, boy, we just almost found it. We'll try again next year. And it could be, I don't know. Other people think it's not even on the mountain, it's down in the valley. Those who think it's on the mountain go over there looking for it, and they always say, oh, it could be here, could be here, could be here, and they're always looking for it. And I'm not against that at all, but I just am telling you, there's no absolute scientific proof that it's even on the mountain. Other folks think it's not even there. They think it's down in the valley because the chances of something landing on a mountain as the mountains are rising or the water's running off, the chances are close to zero. Try it in a bathtub. Bring something up under a floating object. It'll float off to the side. It's more likely to land in what's called a nested area between a bunch of mountains, and the water can slowly drain off. Many people think that the 1960 photograph showed a boat-shaped object that could have been Noah's Ark. As they examined it, then in 1978, an earthquake lifted it up out of the ground, or the ground fell away, or whatever happened. It's now sticking up out of the ground about 10 feet or 15 feet. They think that's Noah's Ark, right there, that boat-shaped object. I've had people tell me that's not Noah's Ark, because when mud flows around an object, it makes a teardrop shape. Well, I understand that. I taught physics. I know how that works. If the front end of an airplane wing is rounded, the back end is pointed. But this one's facing backwards. There are two more teardrop shapes like that, but the round end is uphill. On this one, the pointed end is uphill. This is not a mud flow. Many folks think that's Noah's Ark. I knew Ron Wyatt. He died in 99, but he was a good friend of mine. We differed on quite a few little things, but he was a good guy. He loved the Lord. He and many other folks thought that was Noah's Ark. They did a lot of studies on that and said, yep, yeah, we think that's the ark. They say it collapsed on itself, folded out to the side. It's with ground penetrating radar. They found what they said were deck timbers in there. They found iron rivets and bolted this thing together. They've got some in the museum south of Nashville. I've, I've held the rivets in my hand. Go to Cornersville, Tennessee. As soon as you get off the interstate, this whole abandoned gas station that they've con or converted gas station right there into the museum about Noah's Ark. The government of Turkey said, yep, that's Noah's Ark down in the valley. They built a visitor center. Now there have been some creationist organizations that say, no, it's not Noah's Ark, and we don't like you because you even say it might be. Well, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. If I ever start working for you, I'll do what you say. But meanwhile, I'm going to tell folks I think it's a possibility that it could be <laughs> Noah's Ark. 
The Bible says the ark will be 300 cubits long. Now, a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm 6'1", my cubit is 21 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit was 18 inches. The standard Egyptian cubit is 20.6. That boat-shaped object is 20.6 inches times 300, or 515 feet long. So that doesn't prove it's Noah's Ark, but it could be. It's in the right place, it's about the right shape, and it's about the right length. It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic. Makes it about almost two football fields long. Pretty good-sized boat. In that region, they found 12 big rocks that weigh about 9,000 pounds apiece. These rocks have holes in the top. Apparently, that hole was to hold a rope, and this rock was held over the side of the boat. Ten or twelve, or who knows how many. They found twelve. Could have been more. That's called a drogue stone. If you hang a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat becomes more stable during stormy weather. It's like a whole bunch of shock absorbers to keep the boats flat, you know, keep your platform flat. If it really gets windy, they'll drag behind you, and it turns the boat perpendicular to the waves. Now you can't roll over, capsize. That's real dangerous in high seas. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hoven, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having rocks hanging all over the side. He said, you are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back and said, where was he going? <laughs> He's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to float. Brother. And I'm stupid, yeah. I debated a former preacher turned atheist. And he said, you can't build a boat more than 300 feet long because it'll break going over the waves. He said, they built a ship one time that had six masts, you know, a six-master. And, the, you know, the tw it twisted the boat so bad it leaked all the time. They finally had to give it up. Noah's Ark didn't have any masts. Hello. It's designed to float, not to sail. All right. <laughs> Probably a big barge of some kind. I don't know. He said, a boat, you know, when the waves come up, it bends and breaks in the middle. Well, a lot of boats over 300 feet long have been built out of wood and survived. The Chinese had some really big ones many years ago, out of wood. Plus, if you put a moon pool in the boat, that solves the problem. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls up on the inside, of course, so the boat doesn't sink. And as, the, as you go over the waves, this relieves the stress. Now the water com actually comes up inside the boat partway. A moon pool is a pretty cool idea. As the water goes up and down in that hole, it would be relieving the stress. Great place to dump your garbage, too, by the way, inside the boat, out of the rain. Thirdly, it acts like a giant piston to pump fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. Uh, remember what he had in the basement? You might pray for a good wave once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, what happened to them? If the Bible story is true, as I say that it is, Noah had to have dinosaurs on the ark, so what happened to them? What made the dinosaurs go extinct? That's a question they're always asking the kids in school. There are at least 16 theories floating around the textbooks. They'll say, kids, maybe a meteor struck the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago. Well, another guy from Indiana has got a cool theory. He says the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. <laughs> he said they couldn't stand the heat. I don't know what to do about a theory like that, but uh, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Hey, uh, they're asking the wrong question. The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? You know, the liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They're always asking me, should we teach creation in public schools? I say, that's a good question, and I will be glad to discuss it. However, there's another question we need to ask first. Should we have public schools? Yeah, let's ask that one first. Now, I praise God for the good, godly public school teachers. My mother was a public school teacher and retired. My brother's in his 34th year teaching public school. He led me to the Lord. There are many good, godly public school teachers, okay? But folks, the, work, the books they work from, the curriculum, is corrupt. Yeah. Unfixable, I think. If you, if you love your kids and you possibly can, get them out. I don't think it's fixable. Praise God for the good teachers who are going to slug it out in there, and I'm for you, and I want to help. Okay, but I don't think it's fixable. Bottom line. If you want to find out why we have a public school system... Our Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government's got no business being involved in education. But we've got a public school system as part of a bigger, long-range plan toward a new world order. That's Karl Marx's idea, Communist Manifesto Plank Number 10, free public education. We'll cover more on that on uh, 
seminar part five, and also on our college class, CSE 102. You don't want to watch that one. That's politically incorrect. Anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, they faced a very hostile climate. Things had changed. Remember, before the flood, they lived over 900 years. After the flood, only 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed after the flood, folks. The canopy of water that used to protect them was gone. And you're not going to make it to 100, or 200 for sure. You might make it to 100, but you won't make it to 200. Not in this world. Dinosaurs had two serious problems after the flood. Number one, the climate was a lot different. They just couldn't live long enough to get big enough to reproduce in many cases. So some species probably went extinct in the first few generations. Second problem, I think, was worse. People hunted them. Back in those days, they called them dragons. They didn't call them dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, they called them dragons. Dragons are mentioned in the Bible 35 times. And as the population began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. <laughs> the same thing happened right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many grizzly bears are roaming loose in the woods in this county right here? Zero, right? How many grizzly bears were roaming around Milwaukee area 500 years ago? Probably a whole bunch of them. Well, what happened? As people move in and civilize an area, the big, dino, the big creatures, or ferocious creatures, are driven off or killed off. It happens all the time. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? Every redneck in four counties would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot them. <laughs> right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd put his picture in the paper. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. Well, that's what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, you'd be a hero. They'd tell stories about you around the campfire for generations to come. And there are thousands of stories of people killing dragons. They killed them off for meat. There'd be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them for medicine. It's amazing how many ancient recipes call for dragon bones to be ground up and put in with the medicine. Lots of legends tell of people killing dragons. Gilgamesh supposedly slew a dragon. A Chinese guy named Yu slew dragons that were bothering them as they tried to expand the territory and drain off the swamps and make the land of China livable again. They had to drive off the snakes and dragons. The Babylonian god Marduk is shown pictured on top of a dragon, possibly a fire-breathing dragon. You say, oh, you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Oh, yeah. The Bible talks about a fly fiery flying serpent. The book of Job has a whole chapter, Job 41, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. In our green series of tapes, the topical ones, we've got a whole tape out there, hour and a half, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters. Daniel 13 and 14. It's part of the apocryphal books. It shouldn't be in Scripture. It's interesting reading, but it's not part of Scripture. It says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, it means give me permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation of what's going on here. The Bible tells us Daniel was a man who understood science. He knew full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. They used to have whole industries in America just making pitch to use to uh, waterproof ships. They would coat them with pitch made from tree sap, particularly pine. And fat is very salty tasting, and just about all animals like salty tasting things. The, the hunters put out salt licks for the deer, right? Or cat, cattle have like salt licks. And hair won't digest. He mixed them all together, tossed them in. The dragon liked the taste, swallowed them, but they wouldn't digest. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. You figure it out. 
Anyway, uh, Saddam bin Sain, uh, Hussein, thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar brought back to life. By the way, do you ever notice George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein? There's a reason for that. I've been told, anyway, the word Saddam means prince. Saddam, spelled the same way, means horse's rear end. <laughs> but Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He's got his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency over there, their gold coins. He spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Did you know ancient Babylon has been rebuilt? They always knew where the city was. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. But when Babylon was, they, you know, just buried in the sand, forget about it, they dug it out and the sand had really preserved the bricks extremely well. The old brick walls of the ancient city of Babylon were very well preserved in the dry sand over there. And they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. Now, how did they know about dragons in 600 B.C.? Well, that had been almost 2,000 years since the flood. So from the flood up until, you know, Nebuchadnezzar reigned is 1,800 years. Probably most dinosaurs were gone by then. But I think a few were still around. And he had one in a cage, apparently. In 300 B.C., Alexander the Great reported his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India. This Roman mosaic was made in the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Boy, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Wow. Uh, anyway, how did the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? St. George is famous for slaying dragons in 275 A.D. He finally got killed because he was a Christian. Beowulf slew dragons. You ought to try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. We sell the book only because it's such interesting reading. The Old English is, I think, impossible to read. That's English, folks, from 1,500 years ago. Our language has changed a little bit, okay? Probably the peak of the English language was about 400 years ago when Shakespeare and God chose to use the, make the King James and all that stuff about that time, about the peak of the English language. But the Beowulf story says Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms and the creature bled to death. Strange story. You know, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. There are dragon legends from countries all over the world. Ancient pottery, like this one, probably one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth, from the eight, uh, first dynasty of Egypt, shows two long-necked dragons. Looks like dinosaurs to me. Here's another one showing two long-necked dinosaurs holding a sheep between their mouth, between their mouths. This hippo tusk was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb from the 12th century B.C. It shows an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Why would there be dragon legends from countries all over the world? Thailand has many legends of the dragon. China, of course, is famous for its dragon legends. The uh, gargoyle that you see on the corners of the buildings in Europe, you know, apparently came from the story of a gargoyle, or they called it a dragon, that came up out of the water in France. That's where the gargoyle legend comes from. There's a Russian medallion that shows a man killing a dragon. This Bulgarian postage stamp shows a guy killing a dragon. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, the... Stegosaurus had awful big spikes on his tail. We've got a copy of one in our museum there. There are dragon heads found on the ships that the Vikings used to sail around. Here's a Viking uh, woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a man. Taken from a book called Vikings by Tony Allen. 11th century picture. That's just 900 years ago. They were still talking about pe dragons swallowing people. The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. Excellent book about what happened to Noah's sons and how they spread out, if you like, the genealogy type stuff. He's really brilliant at that. But he mentions many of these ancient people talking about having to fight dragons. You can get that book from our ministry or on our website, drdino.com. Siegfried, the famous Norwegian hero, slew the dragon Fafner about a thousand years ago. Marco Polo lived in China about 800 years ago, 750 years ago, and said the emperor in China was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he come back and tell a story like that? Well, I think it's because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. That's, that's my theory of why he said that. Did you know in 1611, the old Chinese law books tell about they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder? 
Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Mm, let me guess. Uh, to feed the dragon. Yeah, right. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. The Indians used to carve pictures on the cliffs of Grand Canyon and all the canyons out there. One of the pictures they found shows a dinosaur. Now, how did the Indians know about dinosaurs to carve their pictures on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Well, maybe they hunted dinosaurs. Hmm. In 1925, some scientists went down one of the canyons out west, just exploring that region, and here's what they wrote. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, you poor fella. They upset his theories. Hmm. He said, Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, the theories must change. The facts remain. I agree. That's the way science is supposed to work. You can have any theory you want, but if, if the facts don't square with your theory, throw your theory away. They would have thrown out evolution a long time ago, except they don't have a replacement theory other than, you know, maybe creation. He goes on and he says, About a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, It's not a dinosaur. It's impossible. Because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on earth. I want you to notice, he said, dinosaurs went extinct 12 million years. Right? Today they tell the kids, 65 million years. I've been studying the inflation of the age of the earth. <laughs> Did you know in 1770 the textbooks say the earth was 70,000 years old? Some of them do. You go to 1905 textbooks, they say the earth is 2 billion years old. In 1969, the textbooks say the earth is three and a half billion years old. Today it says 4.6 billion. Did you know the earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? <laughs> That's 40 years per minute. Mm -hmm. Aging rapidly, folks. You go to Blanding, Utah, and you can see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliffs there. Here's a painting found in Australia on a, by an aboriginal showing a native running away from a long-necked, round-bodied animal, probably a dinosaur. I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Misha something or other, but it looks like somebody drew a dinosaur on the cliff up there. The Indians talked about the great animal that lived in the lake out there. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. <laughs> he doesn't know that. If nobody's ever seen one, why did they carve them on the cliffs? Hmm? Down in Ica, Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world down there. The Spanish came across there and saw white lines across the desert. Nobody could figure out what those white lines were until they got airplanes and realized these are actually giant images. One of the images shows a spider that looks really strange. One of the legs is longer, sticking out to the side like that. And for years everybody thought, well, these guys were just making up these stories. They're just, you know, it's imagination. They just discovered here recently there's a little tiny spider that lives in the desert. It's extremely rare. Most folks have never seen it, never heard of it. It's only about an eighth of an inch long, this spider. During mating season, that leg grows longer, and that's how they mate with the next spider. Then it goes back in. How, they had to have magnifying glasses to even know that. And here they are carving them huge images out in their desert. Either these guys had incredible eyesight, or they knew about how to do magnify things somehow. Long, get Dennis Swift's book on that. He's got a lot of good stuff on this images down in Nazca. But in, 17, in 1571, the Spanish came across there and they found rocks with strange animals on them. They were carved in these rocks. They brought some back to the king of Spain and said, what are these? He said, I don't know. I've never seen an animal like that. Today they're called the Nazca burial stones. There are about 20 of these in America. We have three in our museum in Pensacola. The largest collection, I think, the second largest collection in America. Three. <clears throat> Some of them show brain surgery. Some of them show replacing artificial, putting artificial limbs on people. One of them shows what appears to be a steam engine. These are from 2,000 years ago when these things were carved on there. About 500 of the stones show dinosaurs with people. Now why would there be dinosaurs and people to carve together on these stones 2,000 years ago? Just about every known dinosaur is pictured on these things, including many unknown dinosaurs. We could spend hours talking. We'll talk more about the Ica stones on our college class uh, 102. But uh, this one shows, Dennis Swift has this one. He shows uh, circles on the side of the dinosaur. Here's one from my museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. Here's another one I've got in our museum. Shows a dinosaur with had his head cut off. Apparently this guy has a knife in his hand. 
cut the dinosaur's head off because the dinosaur killed his friend. That's, we think that's what the story's telling. He's taking vengeance is what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. Uh, <laughs> something like that. I forget how it goes exactly, but that's close enough. <laughs> now, why would they put dinosaurs on these stones? And why put the circles on the side? Now, that's really interesting. You know, if you found dinosaur bones, that would not give you a clue what the skin looked like. Here's these stones from 2,000 years ago showing circles on the side. You know, they found fossilized dinosaur skin about 12 years ago, and it had uh, circle patterns on it. The fossilized dinosaur skin shows circle patterns. It looks to me like they must have seen a live one to know how to do that. This one shows a guy cutting the head off of one. Here's a guy riding a dinosaur of some kind. They found pottery in one of the uh, graves down there. It looked like a dinosaur, clear as a bell to anybody else. It could be a dinosaur on this pottery. The mummy in the grave was wrapped up in a blanket and it had dinosaurs embroidered into the blanket. Now why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets and on their pottery and carve them on cliff walls? You go to Acamburro, Mexico, and they found 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs as they dug to put in a basement at this one house. So wait a minute, what, somebody stored a cache of dinosaurs. Thousands and thousands of them. We could spend many days talking about this, but lots more on that on seminar part two of our series. We cover more on dinosaurs and Ica stones. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. I'm sorry, he does not know that. An Italian fella, 400 years ago, was out walking his cows, taking care of his cows, and a, apparently a dinosaur scared his cows, and he hit the thing on the back of the neck and broke its neck with his walking stick. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display, probably a Tanistrophius. Now, by the way, do you, know, do you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Years ago, they were shipping a bunch of them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, To New York. <laughs> Figured. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Okay. This, <laughs> many people think the Sutton artifact appears to be like a pterodactyl with its wings folded against its body. Another dinosaur. The Romans came across to America long before Columbus did. One of the Roman swords found in Arizona shows a dinosaur on it. I called the guy who's got the sword. I said, uh, Tom, what do you think about this uh, sword? He said, well, it has to be fake because we know man and dinosaurs did not live at the same time. <laughs> oh, do you know that or do you think that? And kids, if you ever get taught that Columbus was the first white man across the ocean, you are mistaken. They are mistaken, okay? Brendan the Navigator came over here in 500 A.D. The Romans came back and forth. Apparently, King Solomon made his ships go back and forth across the ocean to America. There's lots of evidence of trade back and forth long before the Dark Ages shut all that stuff down, apparently. But during the recent age of sailing ships, after the Dark Ages was over, there were many reports during that 400-year span of sightings of sea monsters. Many, many legends of sea monsters exist. I have read so many stories. We can talk for hours on this. I won't, but I've read, I'm sure, 300 books just on the sea monster sightings from ancient ships' log books, stuff like that. It's incredible how many sightings of sea monsters are recorded in ancient books. Captain McKay said his crew saw a sea monster 60 feet long swim under their boat. The whaling ship Monongahela actually killed a 103-foot sea monster. They measured it. They were cutting it up. And another, another ship said, what are you guys doing? They said, we just killed a sea monster. Amazing story to read the whole story about the Monongahela. How the sea monster knocked the captain out of the small boat that went out there to harpoon it. Sailors had to rescue him. He was unconscious. This thing had a huge head. They cut the thing up, put the bones in the boat. The other ship bought the oil sea serpent oil, and went back and told the story. He said, man, the Monongahela's coming in a few months, and they're going to show you guys the bones of a sea serpent. Well, the Monongahela sailed on and was never heard from again. Apparently, it sank in a storm. So I'm sure some more sailors got laughed at for claiming they saw sea monsters. One of the guys who later rescued the folks on the Titanic was Captain Roston, Arthur Henry Roston. In 1907, he saw off the coast of Ireland as a sea monster. He sketched pictures of it. He said it was a sea serpent. Now notice what this author of this book says. This book is called Titanic, Triumph and Tragedy. The author says, however imaginative the young officer may have been. Uh, excuse me, do you see any prejudice in that statement? In other words, he thinks he saw a sea monster, but I know better because, you know, he was there and I wasn't. <laughs> One German submarine commander said that when they sank a British ship during World War I, what appeared to be a giant sea monster came flying up out of the water, 60 feet long, four big flippers. 
There are stories of giant octopus pulling ships underwater. You say, come on, now octopus never get that big. Oh, they get pretty big. This one washed up on the beach in Florida, St. Augustine, about 100 years ago. The octopus was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. That's not the biggest one. A whale was killed near Seattle. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus. All around the whale's body were 18-inch scars, circular scars, where something, either a giant octopus or squid, tried to drown the whale. See, whales love to eat octopus or squid, either one. And squid and octopus never stop growing. Now, if you're an animal that never stops growing, someday you won't have any more enemies. By the way, if you ever see a piece of puked-up octopus floating around in the ocean, be sure to grab it. It's worth a fortune. Does anybody know what they make out of puked-up octopus? Perfume. That is correct. <clears throat> that explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? <laughs> hey, dear. You smell like a puked-up octopus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you can sleep on the couch for a month too, honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There are some awfully big squids out there. The Navy research vessel saw a squid wrestling with a giant whale one time in 1966. Giant squid. This one's in the Peabody Museum. A huge squid model over my head there. They said this one washed up on the beach in New Zealand. It was a baby giant squid. Full grown, it would have been 150 feet long. Some people say, now hold it, Mr. Hovind. If uh, dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible... I mean, if they're mentioned all through history as living with man, are they mentioned in the Bible? I said, oh yeah, they're in there. And they said, I didn't see them in there. Well, you won't see the word dinosaur because that word was made up in 1841. King James was translated in 1611. You know, figure it out. They couldn't use that word. It didn't exist yet. But dinosaurs are in there. If you read the book of Job, Job has 42 chapters. In the first two chapters, it tells us Job was a perfect man. He feared God and hated evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he had thousands of sheep and camels and oxen and asses. The guy was rich. And one day the messenger came and said, Job, I got some bad news. The oxen and asses got stolen and your servants were killed. Oh, and Job, by the way, the sheep all burned up. Thousands and thousands of sheep all burned. Probably lightning or something, who knows. And Job, your camels got stolen. And by the way, Job, your, all ten of your kids died. Job's having a bad day. Lost all of his animals. It's called the stock market crash. <laughs> all ten of his kids died. And the Lord said, or Job said, The Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of guy is this anyway? <laughs> Everybody else would get mad at God, right? Job lost it all. He said, Okay, God, it was yours to begin with. Thanks for letting me use it for a while. Then the devil gave him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And if that wasn't bad enough, his wife turned against him. And Job said, Hey, you foolish woman, shall we not receive good at the hand of God and not evil? Job didn't sin with his lips in all of this. But then his four friends came to torment him, or to comfort him, I mean. One of those guys was the shortest man mentioned in the Bible, Bildad the Shuhite. <laughs> pretty short, folks, okay? These four guys came and they talked to Job for 35 chapters. Most of the book of Job is these guys telling Job why everything went wrong. They had to be Baptists the way I got it figured. <laughs> That's what I am. They said, Job, everything's going wrong, huh? Oh, we know why. You sinned. Now listen, folks. If something bad happens to somebody, you don't know why it happened. You should love them, pray for them, encourage them, and shut up. Don't go to the hospital when they get their gallstones taken out and say, Hey, brother, these aren't gallstones. These are tithes and offerings. God's getting them out of you one way or another. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? Let God take care of why everything's going on. He can handle that just fine. He doesn't need your help at all. So Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boil, sitting in the dust by the graves of his ten kids, wondering, what's going on? He said, I wish the Almighty would answer me. Lord, why is this happening to me? And folks, you don't have to live on planet Earth very long before you're going to be wondering why some things happen to you. If you haven't got there yet, you just keep living. It'll happen. Job didn't know about Romans 8, 28. It was coming, though. God said, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Now, this verse does not say everything that happens is good. 
It says everything will work together for good. It's a big difference. I'll show you. Has anybody here ever been hungry? Ever been hungry? Suppose you come to my house, you say, Brother Hovind, I'm hungry. I'll say, man, come on in, have a seat. I'll give you a cup of flour. <laughs> Ugh. I got it. Lean back, open up. We're going to shove in a spoonful of salt. Now that'll help you. How about a spoonful of baking soda? Oh, wow, that stuff tastes good. You're probably getting kind of dry by now. So lean back. We're going to pour down a half a cup of Crisco. <laughs> and chase it down with a cup of buttermilk. You say, that would taste terrible. How about if we mix them all together first and make biscuits? Hey, now you're talking. Did you know the individual ingredients for biscuits taste lousy? But they work together for biscuits, don't they? You know, God promised everything that happens to you will work together for good if you love God. Life is so simple. Keep your heart right with God. That'll be hard to do because the heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. But you just keep your heart right and everything that happens is good. Finally, though, in chapter 38, the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Boy, if a tornado starts talking to me, I'm going to pay attention. <laughs> and the Lord said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Hey, by the way, many false cults take a lot of their doctrine from the book of Job. One of Job's friends said something like, You know, the dead die and they don't know anything. Well, that's one of Job's friends saying that. It's true that they said that, but what they said was not true. Be real careful getting a doctrine from the book of Job. You know, read the verse and then say, okay, that's interesting. Now, who said this? If it's one of Job's friends, it's true that they said it, but what they said may not be true. Just really be alert. Same thing in Ecclesiastes. That's the wisdom of man under the sun. It's not the wisdom of God above the sun. Okay? Just be real careful about getting your doctrine from those two books. Just take it very slow. God said, Who's darkening counsel by words without knowledge? God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Man, I read that 34 years ago as a brand new Christian, and I thought, what a dumb question. Where were you when I built the earth? How many of you were here when God built the earth? Now, kids, this is going to be complicated. Okay, so listen carefully. Since you were not here when God built the earth, that means that God is older than you are. How many can figure this out with no help? Okay. Did it ever occur to you that God is also smarter than you are? Mm -hmm. Did it ever occur to you that God is stronger than you are? Mm -hmm. Did it ever occur to you that God is richer than you are? You say, Brother Hoven, everybody's richer than I are. <laughs> God certainly is. Try this one. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Things occur to me all the time. I say, wow, I never thought of that before. Did you know that never happens to God? He has already thought of everything. He even knows the under and understands the imaginations of your thoughts and mine. This is a pretty cool verse. Not only does He know your thoughts, He knows the imaginations of the thoughts. That's a whole different level. You see, you can not only think about things, you can actually think about what you're thinking about. Think about that. <laughs> the Bible says God knows your thoughts, and the Bible also says Jesus knows your thoughts. That's one of many verses that prove Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. Not just a God, like Jehovah's Witness say. He is the God in the flesh. God knows your thoughts. And get this, He loves you anyway. Wow, what a nice guy. God asked Job a question, and Job did not answer. So God asked him another one. Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Question mark. Job doesn't answer. So God asked him another one. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Did you know scientists didn't even know there were springs in the sea until 1977? God asked Job this question. Probably Job was written shortly after the flood, right about in this time, when people are still living to be 400 years old. Because Job had ten grown kids all die and lived long enough to see his fourth generation from the new batch of kids that he got. Probably lived right about in here. No mention of the law hadn't been given yet. Most people think Job has written probably the oldest book in the Bible, but not the first one in the Bible. God asked Job question after question. He said, where is the way where light dwelleth? That's a cool verse. Light doesn't stay in a place, it's in a way. 
But then it says, as for darkness, where's the place thereof? Hey, did you know darkness can't move? We're the children of light, right? The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against... The gates don't move. People say, oh, hell's att Satan's attacking us. No, we're just not... We're not on the offense. It's our problem, okay? We're letting them win. We're the children of light. We're supposed to be on the move, folks. Anyway, by, God said, By what way is the light parted, which scattereth east wind upon the earth? Now, wait a minute. Does the light cause the wind? It sure does. Ask any weatherman. The sunlight causes the ground to warm up and the air to warm up, and it causes it to expand, the air, and the wind is come from the sunlight. God said that 4,000 years ago. God said, Canst thou send lightnings? Boy, it's a good thing I can't. How many of you can think of somebody that's lucky to be alive because you can't send the lightnings? You can, I can think of several, yes, sir. God said, Can you send the lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Now, wait a minute. Is God telling Job electricity can be used to send a message? I believe He is, folks. That's how radio, TV, telephone, radar, microphones. Oh, yeah. God said that 4,000 years ago. God asked Job question after question after question. 84 questions by my count. Job never answered one. See, these are the kind of questions that don't need an answer. The question is designed to change the person's attitude. These are the same kind of questions you dads have to ask your kids. See, I have three kids, one of each. Kids get to a certain age and they start to get kind of cocky and they think they should make the rules around the house. The kid comes in one day and says, Hey, Dad, listen, I believe I should be allowed to stay out till four in the morning with my friends. After all, I'm ten now. <laughs> Dad says, Hold on just a minute, kid. You'd like to know why you can't stay out till four in the morning. Well, son, let me ask you a couple questions here. Who pays the electric bill around this house? Who's paying for the house? Who paid for that bed you slept on last night? Who paid for those clothes you're wearing, son? Who pays for the food you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat <laughs> and eat? Who paid for the hot water and soap you took a shower with about a month ago? <laughs> Let's just get it straight right now, son. The Bible is very clear on this topic. He who payeth the bills maketh the rules. Second Opinions, chapter 4. You see, son, me, dad, you, kid. And if you're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, you're going to do it my way. And when you want to do it your way, well, then go get your own roof to sleep under and get your own food to eat, and you can do it your way. That's the golden rule, son. He that hath the gold maketh the rules. <laughs> Who do you think you are, kid? Where were you when we got this land and drove off to grizzly bears and walked uphill to school 40 miles in the snow, barefoot, both ways? I think God's asking Job these questions to change Job's attitude. We come to chapter 40, and God said, Behold now, behemoth. Now what on earth is a behemoth? Some reference Bibles say it could be the elephant or hippopotamus. No, it cannot be either of those. I think behemoth is the long-necked dinosaur, probably the brachiosaurus. Actually, there are 13 different long-necked dinosaurs. The Brachiosaur, the Cetosaur, the Mementosaur, the Seismosaur, the Supersaur, the Apatosaur, the Blondosaur. <laughs> you just have to talk to her kind of slow, okay? Uh. <laughs> You'd be amazed how, many, how much hate mail I get from just that statement. It's an, I say, look, I'm blonde, my sister's blonde, my mother's blonde, my daughter's blonde, okay? I like blondes. And I like making fun of them, too. Okay, so back off. If you don't like it, edit this part of the tape out. All right? <laughs> he says, Behold now, behemoth eats grass as an ox. Some people say, hey, elephants eat grass. And my Bible says elephant. A lot of animals eat grass, okay? Look at the next verse. His strength is in his loins. His force is in the navel of his belly. The biggest part on him is his belly. They say elephants have a big belly. Yep, you're right. Hippos have a big belly. Brachiosaurus has a big belly. He has a big belly. <laughs> so does he. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next verse says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. Wait a minute. His tail's like a cedar tree? Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? <laughs> Not like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. 
You know, before they put those comments at the bottom of the Bible, they really should be required to read the passage at least once. You know, before they comment on it. It's not an elephant hippo. Hello. It's not one of those. Anyway, the Bible says, His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He had big bones. And they did. I've got one here on the table. This is a copy of a toe bone from a brachiosaur. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had big toes. And he had those big toes because he had a big foot. Matter of fact, their foot was big enough to take a bath in, the footprint, if you're a little kid. Picture's on the back of the book uh, from Dinosaur Valley State Park right here. If you want to come by and take a look at that. They had that big foot because he had a big leg to hold up. His front leg is 20 feet tall. The biggest dinosaur found so far was found in Oklahoma, 60 feet to the top of the head. They say it'll take them 20 years to dig, dig all the bones out of the ground because it is a government project. <laughs> they say when it was alive, it might have weighed 100 tons. 100 tons is equal to 14 school buses put together. That means if he was to come by and step on you, you would be deeply impressed by him. <laughs> you would be road pizza. <laughs> by the way, speaking of government projects, <clears throat> I want to show you folks my invention that's going to make me the richest man on planet Earth. I'm going to save so much money for the highway department, construction crews, and utility companies, and the military. And all I want is 10% of the savings. I'll be the richest man on planet Earth. I have invented a shovel that will stand up by itself. <laughs> you won't need to pay those guys to lean on it anymore. Mm -hmm. You just watch when you drive by a construction crew. You'll see what I'm talking about. Everyone can use one of these inventions. Next verse says, He's the chief of the ways of God. He's the chief. That's the Hebrew word for chief, the Resheth. He's the biggest animal God ever made. Well, that would not be the elephant hippopotamus. It'd be the Brachiosaurus. And you know what kind of fits the pattern for the way the devil works? Whenever God makes things, the devil tries to destroy them. God invented beautiful things. God invented music. God loves music. And Satan has come along with some ungodly music you shouldn't listen to. Somebody asked me one time, and they said, Brother Hovind, do you know what you get if you play country music backwards? I said, no. They said, you get your hound dog, your wife, and your pickup all back. Oh, yeah, back masking. I heard about that stuff. And God invented marriage and the family and sex. God made them male and female, and he understands it pretty good, and he put some rules down. Boys, don't touch the girls until you're married to them. Now, if you don't want to touch them, then stay away from me. Okay, I saw your kind out west. but uh, uh, God wants you to have a wonderful life. And he said the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. These movie stars getting married again every six months don't have a clue what the precious life is all about. Now, kids, listen carefully. Here's what you got to do. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing. You, Bible teaches you're to keep yourself pure and your wife or husband keep, keep pure till you both walk down the aisle and the preacher says, wilt thou and you wilt, and then you stick with that one for the rest of your life. That's the precious life right there. God knows what he's talking about. The Bible says God created all the great creatures. God made the dinosaurs. And Satan said, you know, there has to be some way to use dinosaurs against God. But he couldn't fool Adam, not with dinosaurs. Imagine the devil walking up to Adam and saying, Hey, Adam, did you know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? <laughs> Adam would say, Are you dumb or what? There's one in the backyard eating off the cherry tree right now. <laughs> the devil couldn't fool Noah. He fed him every day. But for the next 4,000 years, they became pretty rare. Many species went totally extinct. Gone. And then in 1809, they found the bones and put one together. And the devil was there that day. He said, wow, here we go, folks. My chance, finally, after 4,000 years. Satan said, you know, these critters have always lived with man. I know that, and God knows that. But these people don't know that. So the devil said, I think I'm going to tell everybody they lived millions of years ago. And if they believe it, it'll make them doubt the Bible. And boy, has it worked good. You know, for the last 200 years, kids have been going to kindergarten and getting a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? Millions of years ago. Yeah, sure enough. 
So many books in our libraries teach this stuff. Millions of years ago. How many kids are being taught that in your town at your expense? I go to museums all the time. just makes my blood boil, seeing all these beautiful, incredible museums, fancy displays, loads of money, and the wrong message. Kids are being brainwashed. That's why we started our own. We need lots of creation museums around the country, hundreds of them. You folks need one up here. Somebody start one. Next verse says, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The word fens means the swamp. Well, the biggest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa, right there. Most Americans don't know how big Africa is. There's what America looks like next to the Africa. That swamp is gigantic, bigger than the whole state of, same size as the whole state of Illinois. Gigantic swamp. There have been reports of dinosaurs in that swamp in the last 200 years. There could be a few dinosaurs still alive. I don't think there's very many. I don't think they're very big ones, but I think there's some still alive, folks. We cover lots more on that in the next session. But basically, God made dinosaurs with Adam and Eve. They were big lizards before the flood. Noah took them on the ark. People began killing them. There are very, very few left today, but there might be a few still around. But don't let anybody tell you they lived millions of years ago. That is just plain baloney. We'll cover dinosaurs still alive in the next session after the break. Thank you. All right, in this session, we're going to talk about dinosaurs that may still be alive. Now, I know how crazy that sounds to the average person who's been trained with the humanist line of, you know, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. But some of these guys need to open their mind just a little bit. Maybe somebody can drop an intelligent thought in there. I think from a Christian perspective, the world is very different than what our textbooks teach. I think dinosaurs always lived with people. They called them dragons. There could be some still alive. The Bible teaches before the flood came, there was a canopy of water overhead and water under the crust of the earth. Probably gave optimum conditions for people and animals to live a long time. Actually, they would have lived forever if they hadn't sinned. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They did not live millions of years ago. They were pre-flood. Many indications from history indicate that people have always known about dinosaurs. And yet the textbooks are saying dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Somebody is clearly wrong. And I think I know who it is, and I enjoy showing them who they are. Dr. Seuss even says, millions of years ago, before you were born, millions of years ago, we've just been bombarded with this propaganda for so long, some people actually believe it. Millions of years ago. The Bible says behemoth lives under the shady trees in the fens. The old English word fens means the swamp. Behemoth lives in the swamp. Well, the largest swamp in the world is in Central Africa, right on the equator, called the Likwala Swamp. 55,000 square miles. It is 80% unexplored. That swamp is bigger than any one of those yellow states. It's the same size as any of the three red states. That's a big swamp. Belgium took over this area back in 1885. They colonized the Congo, and it was called the Belgian Congo for many, many years. Then in 1960, the communists went in there and liberated them. <clears throat> you know how the communists liberate countries, don't you? They killed everybody and said, okay, you're free now. Well, <laughs> well today it's called the People's Republic of Congo. But back in the 1700s, even before Belgians went in there, some missionaries went into that swamp and reported there are dinosaurs still alive. In 1910, an article came out in the New York newspaper after folks had gone into the swamp and they said, folks, there are dinosaurs still alive in that swamp. This article appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, 1948. There could be dinosaurs still alive. A game hunter, big game hunter, went in there. His name was uh, Mr. Gobbler. He returned to Africa to, from, from a trip to Angola and announced to the newspaper that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur. The natives in the region called it Chippeque. That was their name for it. Could there be dinosaurs living in the last century. In 1980, a couple of scientists went in there to the Congo swamp. They said it's the most miserable swamp in the world. They said the mosquitoes landed on them at the rate of about a thousand per hour. Just like dust, swarms of mosquitoes swarming around them. Constant battle with mosquitoes, poisonous snakes, poisonous spiders, every kind of critter you can imagine. Plus the pygmies over there are taught, if you ever see a white man, he's probably a spy. The communists go in there and tell them that to keep, you know, everybody else out of the Congo. 
Well, Roy Mackle from the University of Chicago and a couple other guys went into that swamp, tromped around for a while. The natives kept talking about a couple of animals. One that was interested them was the animal called Mahamba. When they showed him a picture of a crocodile, they said, yep, that's Mahamba, right there. And the scientists said, well, how big does Mahamba get? And they pasted it off on the sandbar, 50 feet. Said, right. Of course, now if you're a pygmy, four foot four, a 50 foot crocodile looks real big to you. But they claim there are 50 foot crocodiles in the swamp. I don't know, that's what the natives said, and they live there. They also talked about an animal called Mokele Mbembi. Mokele Mbembi. When Dr. Mackle said, fellas, what is Mokele Mbembi? They draw a sketch on the ground of an apatosaurus or a cetosaurus, one like this right here. Dr. Mackle said, fellas, that's a dinosaur. They've been dead for 70 million years. <laughs> and the natives said, we're sorry, we didn't know about that. <laughs> We've never been to America to study evolution. All we know is we see them out in the swamp once in a while when we're fishing. Now, they're not very big, okay? They're about 20 feet nose to tail is what the natives will tell you. Most of the body is about the size of a hippopotamus, just a long neck and a long tail. They live underwater. They're very rarely seen. They apparently are nocturnal, active at night. And so the chances of seeing one are close to zero. You could even live there for your whole lifetime and never see one. It's not like they're real common, okay? There are just a few left in this big swamp. I live in Florida. I've been there 15 years. You know there are panthers in Florida? I've only seen one in 15 years and it was dead on the highway. It's possible for a lot of animals to avoid detection. Anybody knows that that studies animals at all. Well, Dr. Mackle went there and the natives said, oh yeah, Mokele and Bembe's favorite food is a malombo plant. If you find some of these plants along the side of the river and you find there are no alligators or hippos, probably Mokele and Bembe lives there. Because he's so ferocious, even the hippos and alligators are afraid of him, or crocodiles. He drives them out of their part of the river. They found footprints of one of the animals. Dr. Mackle's phone number here, and he's got a California and a Chicago house. There he is. He said, look, I've been there. That's what the natives say. Missionary uh, Eugene Thomas was there for 42 years. He's retired now back in Ohio. There's his phone number. He said, yeah, I had met pygmies that knew about these creatures. He said, they live in the swamp. He said he met two pygmies that killed one and ate it back in 1959. There are just so many stories about Mokele and Bembi from that swamp region over there. Different countries around that region have different languages, of course, and they call it by different names, but they all describe this creature right here. Marcelina Ignagna saw one. He's a biologist from the Congo. He said it looked like that. Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Miller went there, came back. He said, boy, the pygmies over there just nearly killed us. They got us, captured us. They thought, we thought they were going to kill us. Fascinating story from World Explorer magazine, wexclub.com, W-E-X for worldexplorerclub.com. They're right down here in Chicago is where their headquarters are, near Chicago. Some guys from Los Angeles went to the swamp and said, look, we saw one, but our cameras malfunction because of the high humidity. It ruined everything. It's not like you just drive in, take a picture, and drive home, okay? It's just not the same, right? It's a little tough conditions over there. They said the creature was uh, brownish in color. The skin appeared slick and smooth. It had long neck and a small head. Herman saw it. Kia saw it. That's his wife. And on several occasions, they heard it making a tremendous roar. Many other members of the expedition, and this includes government officials from the Congo, saw it and heard it. There's an article from the Boston newspaper about a group getting ready to go over and look for the half-god, half-beast, Mokele and Bembe creature. This is in uh, 1999. There have been about 30 expeditions into that swamp looking for this critter right here. Many of those that come back say, man, all the natives over there know about it. It's like, you know, it's not a big deal. There have been so many expeditions, uh, 30 some that I know of, plus maybe more. The natives claim that they live in, a, in caves along the side of the rivers, and they're more active at night, very difficult to spot these critters, and they stay underwater. So not only at night, but underwater at night, which makes it even tougher to see. Roy Mackle wrote a book about it. We sell the book. We're finally able to get some from the Netherlands. If you want to get his book, it's like 25 bucks, but uh, about a living dinosaur. Now, Roy Mackle believes in evolution. After going over to the swamp, he came back. He went over there twice, spent a quarter million dollars, <laughs> He came back and said, folks, there are some dinosaurs still alive. And then he said, it's amazing they survived for 70 million years. <laughs> oh, well, we're working on Roy about that one. Uh, it's not millions of years ago. Um, William Gibbons from Canada has been over there four times now. He and I wrote this book together, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. 
William contacted me and said, Mr. Hovind, I've been there four times. I said, William, I've been collecting stuff for 30 years on cryptozoology. Let's write a little book together. So he did for kind of junior high, lower high school age, about dinosaurs still alive. William went back to Cameroon, and he said, he had a guide named Pierre Sima. He said, we were the first white man to actually penetrate the forest and swamps bordering the Bumba River. Our informants, mostly all of them Baca pygmies, with the exception of one elderly Muslim Cameroonian, are perfectly familiar with all the known and unknown animals of the forest and swamps. They do not regard the Lakele Mbembe as being an unusual animal. They do fear the creature because of its ferocity in attacking hip hippos, elephants, and even crocodiles. The animal appears to be completely intolerant of any other large creature that shares the river and controls large stretches of the river, particularly those areas where its food supply is present. I was on uh, 100 Huntley Street, a program from Toronto, Canada one time. I'm sitting there getting ready to go on the air. And there's another guy, a missionary, who's going to go on and talk for a few minutes about his mission work. And he was looking through Roy Mackle's book, and he saw that picture. He said, Brother Hovind, my wife and I were missionaries in Kenya, Africa for 15 years. We saw one of those animals. He said, but the plates on the back were bigger. There have been about five reported sightings that I've been able to find in the last hundred years of people seeing what apparently are stegosaurus-type creatures, plates on the back. In South America, there's a jungle called the Amazon jungle that is absolutely gigantic. There have been many reports of creatures in the Amazon that are pretty strange. For instance, in 1907, Colonel Fawcett from the British Army was sent down there to mark the border between a couple of countries. He was known as a meticulous recorder of facts, one of those no-nonsense kind of guys. He reported a creature that he believed to be a Diplodocus. The people down in that valley said, oh yeah, that's... Uh, that animal's out there in the, in the river. Don't bother them. They're not friendly. Colonel Fawcett's son drew a picture of the uh, footprints that they saw. Appears to be a three-toed dinosaur of some kind. In, in 1883, this article came out in Scientific American before they became very careful about filtering out anything that might support creation. Now they're very careful about filtering that stuff out. You know, If it might support creation, it'll never make the Scientific American paper. But this article said, The Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, had remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of drawings of an extraordinary saurian dinosaur killed on the Beni, that's the name of the river, after receiving 36 balls. They shot it 36 times. By order of the President of Bolivia, the dried body, which had been preserved in Asuncion, was sent to La Paz. It was 12 meters long, 39 feet, with snout from to, uh, to point of the tail. Describes the whole thing in Scientific American. The neck is long, the belly large, and almost dragging the ground. Professor Gilvetti, who examined the beast, thinks it is not a monster, but a member of a rare or almost lost species, as the Indians in some parts of Bolivia use small earthen vases of identical shape and probably copied from nature. Hmm. Here's a picture of a giant snake that actually swallowed a human. There are some big snakes down there, folks. They cut it open, there's a guy inside of it. Yeah. Colonel Fawcett said he shot and killed a 62-foot anaconda snake. The natives that were with him said, Colonel, you should see the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't a big one. The Columbia, or officials from the Brazil-Columbia Boundary Commission in 1933 killed a 98-foot snake with two, two foot diameter. They killed it with a machine gun. It, the head, it, it weighed two tons. Four men were unable to lift its head. The cook from a hotel in the Amazon jungle said he saw a 100-foot snake the military hunted down and killed because it eat, ate two of their soldiers. The snake's head was five feet long. Reuters News Service reported this creature back a few years ago, a 130-foot long serpent, the diameter about 15 feet, crashed through the jungle. The soccer team was terrified that saw it go by. 1948, this picture was taken showing a giant snake carcass floating down the river. The people said it might have been 150 feet long. Nobody poked it to see if it was alive. <laughs> we'll just let that one go on by. See, many Americans cannot comprehend how big the Amazon River is. I had one of my former students who was a missionary down there for a while, right there in central Brazil. He said, Brother Hovind, where we live, the Amazon is only nine miles wide. Can you imagine a river nine miles wide? That's a big river. There have been many creatures seen in that South American region. We can talk more about that later. There's a famous lake called Loch Ness. How many have ever heard of Loch Ness before? 
There's a big map on the table down here under all the junk about the Loch Ness. If you, it's a map from Scotland if you want to read it. Loch Ness is about 24 miles long, a mile to a mile and a half wide, and up to 900 feet deep in places. Big lake. In 1933, they blasted with dynamite a groove into the side of the mountains to put a road along the edge of Loch Ness. Before that time, if you wanted to see the lake, you had to climb over the mountains because the road was on the wrong side of the mountains. Very sparsely populated up in that region of Scotland, northern Scotland. Well, 1933, they put a roadbed in there, and then there began to be many sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. There were sightings before, but mostly local people, and the news didn't get out much, and if it did, people thought, well, they've been drinking too much, you know, something up there in the hills of Scotland. Well, this, author, this author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. The first year they put the road in, there were 52 separate sightings. He said there have been 9,000 reported sightings. Today it's over 11,000. Many are certainly fakes and frauds, I understand, okay? But the fact that there's a few fakes and frauds does not discredit all 11,000. Sir Peter Scott said, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. He's a member of Parliament. He said, I believe in it. Most of them say it's a plesiosaurus. Plesiosaur is this kind. There are about, uh, I'm going to say five or maybe six different kinds of swimming dinosaurs that are similar to this. The plesiosaur, the elasmosaur, a couple other unusual ones. Well, this author said, there's one thing wrong with Nessie being a plesiosaur. Plesiosaurs became extinct 70 million years ago. <laughs> oh, is that what's wrong with the theory? Yeah, we better throw out all the evidence then, since it doesn't match your theory. <laughs> when you get 11,000 people who claim they've seen something, maybe they've seen something. Hmm? Arthur Grant was a veterinarian student. He nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle. Here's what he said. He said, I had a splendid view of the object. In fact, I almost struck it with my motorcycle. It had a long neck, oval-shaped eyes, on top of a small head. The tail would be five to six feet long and very powerful. He said, the total length of the animal, 15 to 20 feet. Knowing something of natural history, I can say I've never seen anything in my life like the animal I saw. It looked like a hybrid. That's what he wrote about it. He drew that sketch right there after nearly hitting it with his motorcycle. Alexander Campbell was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said, I saw Nessie uh, 18 times. He said, it looked like that. He said, the closest he ever saw it was three feet away. He was out in his boat sitting there, motor not running, been sitting there for hours. All of a sudden, Nessie popped its head up beside his boat, turned, scared both of them half to death. <laughs> Nessie took off and he took off. People have tried to catch it with cages. They've tried everything you can imagine and some things you can't imagine trying to catch Nessie out there. This is a gigantic lake. Loch Ness is big enough that everybody in the world could go drowned in it at the same time. That lake would hold six billion bodies. It's a big lake. Many folks claim they've seen Nessie. One family said they saw it with a sheep in its mouth headed back for the water. This guy got a picture of it with its back sticking out of the water. Here's the neck over here. When they republished this picture in Reader's Digest, I've got it on the table down here somewhere, uh, they cropped the head off. You know, Reader's Digest, shortened version. Uh, they, all they show is the hump on the back. McLeod said he watched it for nine minutes through binoculars. He took, drew four sketches of what he saw. He said it was halfway out of the water on shore on the other side, you know, a mile away, pretty far. But he said it put a big flipper up on shore and pushed off and rolled back into the water. After watching it for nine minutes, he said the head was moving back and forth in the brush like a snake. He said, I think it looks like that. That's his sketch of Loch Ness Monster. Several folks have reported like horns or tubes on top of the head, maybe breathing tubes or maybe horns. Maybe there's a male and female that, you know, one's different than the other. I don't know. World Book Encyclopedia put a submarine over there, spent a fortune bringing a submarine from Georgia or South Carolina, took it over there, put it in the water. The guy went down in the sub and said, Raisin. It's wrinkled up and there are many places to hide. And I'm sure Nessie heard 24 boats coming down the lake. You know, sound travels really good underwater. <laughs> there could be caves off the side of Loch Ness going up into the mountainous regions right on the side. It's kind of what they call karst topography, very uh, porous ground over there. Nessie may have wintering grounds up inside a cave someplace where there'd be an air chamber, an airlock. I don't know, just one theory about that. The Academy of Applied Science went over there, and so they got a picture underwater of its flipper which is a good trick now. The water is muddy, but they set up sonar-activated cameras. They said Nessie swam past. They took pictures of all kinds of fish and finally got this giant flipper picture. Hmm. Nessie has, apparently, four big diamond-shaped flippers. Here's the picture in Reader's Digest showing Nessie with its mouth open. 
Many folks have gotten pictures. They claim this picture is a fake, and it very well could be a fake. I don't know. But I think it's awfully interesting. They waited till the last guy who was involved died and then announced it's a fake. They claim that he said it was a fake on his deathbed, but he's dead now, so how are we going to ask him? <laughs> a little fishy there, but anyway, I'll accept it. Let's assume it's a fake. Maybe. But there are seven other lakes in Scotland reporting creatures like this. Loch Lochie, Loch Morag. All you got to do is go to the library. If it's on the uh, Dewey system, go to 001.9, and there'll be books about Loch Ness Monster. On the Library of Congress system, go to QL89, and there'll be books about Loch Ness Monster. I've read every one I can find in many, many libraries. There are lots of books on this topic. I was in uh, Wales a few months ago. Just south of Wales, there's a, a bay called uh, Cornwallis, the Cornish Sea. Many folks reported seeing the Cornish Sea Serpent down there. In the English Channel, there have been many reports of a creature like Loch Ness Monster in the English Channel. In uh, 1766, we believe the dictionary we have, the cover page is torn off, so we're not sure, but we think it's a 1766 dictionary. They listed Sea Dragon as a marine monster caught in England in 1749, resembling in some degree an alligator, but having two large fins which served for swimming or flying. It had two legs terminating in hoofs like those of an ass. The body is covered with impenetrable scales. It had five rows of teeth. Interesting. This thing washed up on the beach in Normandy, France, where D-Day took place. This happened way before that, though. 1934, the creature washed up on the beach. Professors came and looked at it. They said, it's not a whale. It's not a sea cow. It is possible we're in the presence of an unknown species. Time magazine, 1934. Two scientists were on board a ship down near Brazil when this thing swam past their boat. They observed it from the yacht. They said it had a dorsal fin six feet long, two feet high, a small head on a long, neck about seven or eight feet long in front of the fin. Two experienced naturalists saw it and reported, and reported the sighting. What they claimed was something unknown to science. This guy said, I saw swimming parallel to the ship underwater a curious creature about four feet long with a long neck and large flippers. I believe, as did my wife, who also saw it, it was a young plesiosaurus. A Queensland correspondent wrote me that a young plesiosaur was taken in a net off Mudgee Beach, Australia. He sent me a sketch which was like the one I myself saw off the coast of Greece. Sir Arthur, Arthur Conan Doyle said that. Interesting. Down near the coast of New Zealand, a Japanese fishing boat pulled this thing up out of their water one time, 1977. It was 4,000 4, pounds, 32 feet long. They said, what is that? They took a bunch of pictures. The sailors on board thought it was something really unusual. They took all kinds of photos of it, took some skin samples, and threw it back. It stunk real bad. The marine biologist on board made that sketch of the bones. They made a special stamp for Japanese mail, 1977. There's one on the yellow poster on front of the table here. If you want to see the stamp they made. Now, some folks today claim it was a basking shark. It certainly could be, I don't know, but they don't know either. The scientists on, who had it in their hands said, we think it's a plesiosaurus. Now, it's true, they analyzed the protein. It was 96% similar to shark protein. Okay, that doesn't mean it's sharks. It could be. Nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein to know what it's supposed to look like. And I don't know if it's a shark or not. I just say it's interesting. They caught this thing and they claimed it was a plesiosaurus. They say it's got the protein elastidin. Well, a lot of animals have elastidin in it. 96% similar to shark protein, so what? Humans and apes are very similar in their protein structure, but are very different creatures. Nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein. The fishermen had it and said, we know what basking sharks are, and they didn't think it was a basking shark. So the story still rages, and there are some creationist organizations that don't like me because I even mention the fact that they might have had a plesiosaur. I just am bringing it up for study purposes, okay? Some Russian scientists claim they saw a dinosaur in a lake in Russia. In 1994, a 39-foot carcass washed up on the beach in Russia, and everybody said it was a dinosaur. In Japan, up on the North Island of Japan, there have been reports of a creature like a dinosaur in a lake there. There's also one on the South Island of Japan. The, cre the people there call it uh, Ishi. In China, there have been reported sightings of a creature similar to a dinosaur. They call it a USO. Unidentified swimming object. <laughs> what would you call it? Uh, there are several lakes in Norway and Sweden reporting creatures like this. There are many legends from ancient Swedish and Norwegian artwork showing what appear to be dinosaurs. Canada has many lakes reporting creatures that are called Canadian lake monsters. Nessie's cousin, Nessie's Canadian cousin is an article here in the paper in the, from the town of Kelowna, British Columbia, north of Washington. There's a giant lake there. The lake is 80 miles long. 
The people there call it the Ogopogo. Now, what is the Ogopogo? Well, the Indians warned the white settlers when they came out there, said, oh, be careful about the Ogopogo. He will tip your canoe over and kill you. This article says uh, right here, they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80-mile-long lake in southern British Columbia. One swimmer swam, was swimming out there in the lake, and he said this creature came up under him. He said it was 20 to 30 feet long. He said, we've never seen a sturgeon in the lake. Some people thought it might be a big sturgeon. He said, nobody's ever seen a sturgeon in that lake. Creature showed up on sonar scan here from the Kelowna newspaper, Daily Courier, in, 19, in the year 2000. There's another creature called Cadborosaurus, which apparently is on the Pacific coast along from British Columbia down as far as Oregon. The caddy, they call it. A couple of scientists uh, actually uh, have spent years studying the Cadborosaurus and written books about it. Professor LeBlanc from University of British Columbia says it's probably a new species to science. The remains of a baby one are found inside the stomach of a sperm whale. Adult caddies get seven meters long, about 22 feet long. They say it has a long neck and short pointed front flippers and a horse-like head. One guy was actually out there with a sailboat and, uh, and caught one, a little baby one, about 18 inches long. He put it up in his dip net, put it in a bucket, and drew a sketch of it. There's the sketch. He didn't know what it was. He didn't have a camera. But it was obviously trying to get out of the bucket. It was panicking, trying, you know, trying to get out. So he dumped it overboard, let it, let it go. But that's a sketch he drew. I interviewed this guy for an hour up in Canada. He and his three buddies there saw a creature that actually chased their boat off the coast of Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia. I preached up there about 10 years ago. I met with a guy. Here's what he told me. He said, Dr. Hoven, he was 67 years old at the time. He said he'd been fishing out there since he was five. It's a fishing village. He said a 40 to 50 foot long creature chased their boat for one to two miles with its head out of the water, about 15 feet. That's not a fish. He said it had a wide mouth and four foot tusks like a walrus, as well as other pointed sharp teeth about the size of his finger. I showed him a plesiosaur. He said, well, that's close, but it's not exactly like that. He said the neck that he saw was two foot diameter and the eyes were eight to nine inch diameter. Hmm. He said they were six miles south of Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia. The water was 180 feet deep and flat cam. They say calm, cam, flat cam. I said, what do you mean flat cam? He said, you know, flat cam, no waves. Oh, you mean calm. Okay. Now, he said, I don't want to see it again. That's what he told me. The other three guys refused to even talk to me. They said, look, we got laughed at enough. We're not even going to talk about it. This thing washed up on the beach in uh, Newfoundland, Canada, about two years ago. Nobody ever identified it, a giant creature of some kind. Another one came up in Parker's Cove, Canada, this thing. I had a guy who came to my house and spent two hours talking to me. He said, Brother Hovind, I was vacationing up there. He said, I've got a uh, uh, bed and breakfast right near there. He said, this thing washed up on the beach. I got a whole article of him talking to me, September 18th, 2002. He said, I went over to Parker's Cove, two hours drive, saw this creature laying on the beach. He said, some of the scientists said it was a basking shark. Other people said, no, it's not a basking shark. You know, typical argument. All they knew was it stunk. Everybody kept cutting pieces off of it to take, have a piece of the sea monster to take home. But there were articles in the paper about this giant creature, whatever it was. I don't think it was ever positively identified, except some folks think it was a sea monster. Some folks think it was a basking shark. I don't know. But it's gone now. There are a couple of samples, though, that uh, people up in Canada still have. I think it would be worth getting those analyzed uh, scientifically to get the structure of it. It had a little hair on it. I don't know of any sharks that have little hairs, unless that is frayed protein, which it could be, but it appears to be some type of hair or fur, whatever it is. Many people reported this creature as having a hair or fur on it. And there's all the pictures you can see for yourself what it is. We've got all kinds of books out there on the table or on my website, Dr. Dino, about uh, dinosaurs living with people. I interviewed Jacques Boivet right here for three hours. We talked and talked and talked because he's been collecting for years sightings of the Lake Memphremagog monster which is between New York, I mean, between uh, Vermont and Quebec, Canada. He has file after file of stories of people who claim they've seen Memphrey. In 1992, just that one year alone, there were eight sightings involving 26 people, just in that one year. There have been reports of some kind of strange creature in the Potomac River. They say it resembles the Loch Ness Monster. This one lady said her husband shot one of the smaller monsters in the neck. It rose out of the water and disappeared took off down underwater again. In 1800s, there were many reported sightings of a sea monster in Boston. Lots of people saw this thing, like a giant sea snake. There's an island off the coast of Rhode Island. The island is called Block Island. 
1994, I've got lots of material on this one, um, 1996, a creature was caught there, 14 feet long. Here's the sketch, here's, here's the actual picture of it right here. Somebody stole the bones and it disappeared. Nobody knows where it is now. But of course, they called it the Block Ness Monster, you know, Block Island. In Lake Erie, there's been lots of people claim they've seen a creature in Lake Erie. Erie's Bessie matches Nessie, this article says. They describe it as black, 35 feet long, with a snake-like head. There are many articles in the paper and many folks who will swear they've seen the Lake Erie monster. We could spend two days on that one also. I, I talked to John Kraft, who photographed Lake Erie monster. He said, Brother Hoven, I saw this critter with its head sticking out of the water. By the time I got my camera set up, the head was down. All I got was the back. Sorry. But that's the best picture I've got, he said. I talked to Pete Peterson, who owns a bait shop on Lake Erie. He's also a taxidermist. He said he was walking along the shore of the beach and he saw this carcass and the buzzard or the seagulls were picking it apart. So he shooed off the gulls and got this critter, critter and took it home and stuffed it. He's a taxidermist. He said, I don't know what it is. Sure looks strange, doesn't it? I said, yes, sir, that looks strange. It's in a museum in Texas now. It's never been positively identified. In Situate Harbor, Massachusetts, I went there and interviewed the sheriff who was the first man on the scene when back in 1970, this thing washed up on the beach. He said, people, a rock, roll, rock and roll music station came on at 3 in the morning and announced there's a sea monster laying on the beach. And people came from miles, plugged up this little bitty town's highway system, and everybody started cutting off chunks of the sea monster. He said, Brother Hovind, I saw it before it got cut up. He said, I'm telling you, that was some kind of long neck sea monster. He said, I don't know what it was. Other people said, it's a basking shark. That's always their answer, basking shark, it's, you know, standard way to explain it. Could have been, but he said, I saw it before it got cut up and it wasn't a shark of any kind, not a basking shark. In California, 1925, this critter washed up on the beach. There's the head right there. There's his eyeball. The neck comes down to the right here. This guy behind him has a rifle just in case it moves again. <laughs> the neck was 20 feet long. The book uh, Shipwrecks and Sea Monsters out there on the table or on my website has all these pictures in there. 20-foot neck. I had one atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know that was a whale? I wrote back and said, just exactly where is the neck on a whale? <laughs> Ought to be between the front flippers and the head, don't you think? <laughs> it's not a whale. Uh, duh. One guy said it's a, it's a bard's whale, a rare form of bard's beaked whale. Well, there's a bard's beaked whale right there. This thing had a 20-foot neck. I'm sorry, you're mistaken, okay? It was a new creature. The people who claimed, they, who saw it and examined it said it was a plesiosaurus. If that bothers you, tough. That's what they said. The only reason it bothers some people, though, is because they've already got a preconceived theory that they like. They like the evolution theory because it gets rid of God. It's a wonderful way to leave God out of the picture. Back in the 1930s and 40s, Monterey was famous for having the famous, uh, world's famous sardine fleet. They'd go out there and catch sardines by the gazillions and sell them all over the world. And many folks in the sardine fleet reported sighting creatures like this. One crew said it surfaced right near their boat and stared at the crew with large baleful eyes from a rounded head that topped a long slender neck. Notice the shape of the head is shaped like a light bulb. We're going to see that again in a minute. A bulb shaped head on top of a long neck. There's a book called uh, Mysterious Sea Monsters of California's Central Coast you can get from our website. In 1969, fishermen nearly dropped their rods when they were fishing off one of the bridges in New York City when the New York Harbor Patrol chased this creature, bigger than a whale, upriver past one of the largest cities in the world. Couldn't catch it. They didn't know what it was. There are many stories of basilosauruses still alive today. In White River, Arkansas, Newport, Arkansas, there were many folks in the 1970s who reported seeing the White River Monster. There were so many reported sightings that Arkansas, the Senate, passed a, uh, they designated the White River Monster Sanctuary, passed a resolution. It's unlawful to molest, kill, trample, or harm the White River Monster. 1973. I talked to Cloyce Warren, who took that photograph. I said, Cloyce, what was it? He said, Mr. Hovind, honestly, I don't know. He said, I had a whole bunch of pictures from the last roll of film I took. He said, I took them all into the newspaper there in Newport, Arkansas, and said, here, you've been laughing at us for claiming there's a monster in the river. By the way, the river there is 100 feet deep. I said, here's a roll of film. I haven't even opened it. You guys develop it, and you'll see the pictures are right on there. 
Well, the guy at the newspaper didn't realize it was color film and developed it with black and white developer. Ruined the whole role. So Cloyce went out and got one or two more pictures. He said, they're not near as good as the other ones I had. I'm sorry. In 1972, I believe, there was a flood that filled in much of the river. His pictures were taken in 71. Arkansas Senate passed a resolution in 73, a couple years later, to protect the White River monster. Off the coast of Jupiter, Florida, there have been many reported sightings of creatures there. One guy wrote me this letter. He said, Dr. Hovind, during the 50s, I was flying off Jupiter, Florida, where I lived. I was seven or eight miles out over the Gulf. The water was glass calm. Suddenly, I saw an animal. Its head came out of the water. Its eyes stayed trained on me as I made another pass. It appeared to be 30-plus feet long. Having seen the creature taken by the Japanese fishing boat, and later the drawing of the National, in the National Enquirer, I, could say that th I would say this is the same creature. I didn't tell anybody for fear they would think I was nuts. I was working for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Company with high security. Later, my brother and I caught a pygmy sperm whale for the Miami Sea Aquarium, Captain Gray. I hope this will further support your belief. I get letters and calls and phone emails like this just about every week. I've got huge files of people who claim they have seen something that appears to be a dinosaur in this century. There's a big lake between New York and Vermont called Lake Champlain. Many folks claim they've seen the Lake Champlain monster. I talked to Sandy Mancy that took this picture. I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, oh no, I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes. We'll put at the end of this tape her interview that I did with her describing the creature she saw, a plesiosaurus. Fifty-eight people in Lake Champlain saw what appeared to be a creature 30 to 35 feet long swimming off the port side of the boat 200 feet away. They saw it for five minutes. The skipper said, don't tell me it's a fish. If it was, it weighed three or 5,000 pounds. Discover Magazine ran that article. There are stories in the Bible of dragons in the sea. Hmm. The dragon in the sea, mentioned in Isaiah 27. In Pensacola, Florida, where I live, back in 1963, five teenagers, older teenagers, decided to go scuba diving on the Massachusetts. One of them came back. He made that sketch. He was frantic. He said, that thing ate my four friends. Here's the story as he told it. They were scuba diving on a sunken ship called the Massachusetts. I've got page after page after page of interviews, stories and things about this creature. But he said, we were an Air Force rescue raft bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we got caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog. We began to hear strange noises, rather like the splashing of a porpoise. Also, a sickening odor like dead fish. The noise got closer to the raft and we heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole about 10 feet high sticking straight up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. He said it bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we got in the water, we became split up in the fog. From behind, I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long, brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like a sea turtle, except more elongated. He, saw, he said the eyes were green with oval pupils. In a different book, he interviewed several folks after this happened, and then he stopped giving interviews altogether. But in this book, he said, I don't know how long it was before we heard a scream. It lasted maybe half a minute. Then I heard Warren call, hey, help me, it's got Brad. I've got to get out of here. His voice was cut off abruptly by a short cry. Hey, Brad, Warren, Brad, Warren, hey, where is everybody? I yelled back at the top of my lungs. Lauren, or Larry, now swam with Eric and me. Warren and Brad were nowhere in sight. Right next to Eric, that telephone pole-like figure broke water. I could see the long neck and two small eyes. The mouth opened and it bent over. It dove on top of Eric, dragging him under. I screamed and began to swim past the ship. My insides were shaking uncontrollably. That's the sketch of what ate his friends. He said, the next morning I was found by the rescue unit. I shared this story at a meeting one time when I was speaking in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, not far from my house. Um, Edward McClary was the only survivor. After I shared the story, a lady came to me after and she said, Mr. Hoven, my name is Val Bill. My stepson, Larry, was one of the kids who was eaten by that creature. She said, this story you are telling is exactly correct. That's what she said. There's your phone address if you want to write her, if you don't believe me. 
Down the river, from, down the bay from us, or down the, down the beach from us, is Panama City, Florida, about 100 miles away. I was speaking down there, and a youth director came to me afterwards. He said, Brother Hovind, I'm a youth director at a Lutheran church. He said, my youth group was in the van driving across the bridge in Panama City, and we saw a creature just like that one you've got in your book down there. He said, the kids all saw it. Everybody saw it in the van, but they all said, man, if we tell anybody, they're going to think we're crazy. There have been many reports like this. Who knows how many have not been reported? I interviewed a lady who was, grew up in Panama, Panama uh, South, Central America. She said she was riding her horse along uh, the ocean, on the Pacific Ocean, and she saw a plesiosaur. She's married to a pastor who's a Baptist pastor in Arkansas now. I interviewed her uh, been several winters ago. I have interviewed probably 80 people face-to-face -face who said, look, I've seen one. There have been 20,000 reported sightings in the last century. There have been reports of pterodactyls still alive. In Africa, they call it the Kangamato. In Kenya, they call it uh, Batamzinga. That's their name for it. I was sitting in my office one time, and the phone rang, and this guy said, Mr. Hovind, my name is, they call him Steve. He said, my first, Af my African name is real long, so they call him Steve. He said, I'm on the Kenya Olympic running team. I'm over here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm going to school at Louisiana State. He's graduated now and gone. I don't know what happened to him. He said, you mentioned in your seminar that I just saw that pterodactyls might still be alive. Here's one here on the table. There have been many reports of pterodactyls, and I mentioned this in my seminar. Steve said, Mr. Hovind, I'm from Kenya, and I want you to know we have those creatures in my village. He said, they're only about a four-foot wingspan. He said, they've got a bump on the back of their head. He said, why do your schools in America say they lived millions of years ago? I said, because we're dumb over here. <laughs> he said, they're very rarely seen, and most people in my village don't like them, and some people are superstitious about them, because their favorite food appears to be decaying human flesh. So if you bury somebody, you better bury them deep, or Kangamato will come dig them up and eat them. Frank Mellon, the African explorer, heard about rumors about an animal called the Kangamato, lived in the Jundu swamps in the northwest corner of northern Rhodesia, near the Belgian Congo. He asked the natives what it was. They told him it was a bird, but not exactly a bird. More like a lizard with wings like a bat, the wings made of skin. He showed them pictures of pterodactyls, and all of them immediately plumped for the pterodactyl, excitedly muttering, Kangamato. A couple of cowboys apparently shot one back in 1880-something in Arizona, cut off the wingtips and took it back to the uh, saloon and said, Fellas, we just shot a giant bird with no feathers. Here's part of the wingtips. They had skin, not feathers. In Venezuela... A missionary told me that he's been down there for years and the natives kept talking about an animal that they're afraid of, a giant bat. They were scared of this animal. He said it would capsize canoes and carry off Indians. I met with Adam in 98. He told me the Indians were terrified of this bat and years ago they had sent their bravest men to the head of the, head, head of the river where they killed one of the creatures years ago and buried it near the Mawada River. When Clint showed the Indians a picture of a pterodactyl, their eyes got big as saucers and they said, that is the bat. They positively identified this extinct dinosaur as the bat that lived a few miles from their village. Even today, the Indians will not fish or drink from the river for fear of this creature. Missionary Tyson Hughes told Bill Gibbons, who wrote the book with me, that he knew uh, of a creature in Saram, Indonesia, right here. But the locals called the creature the uh, orangbatai, which means man with wings. My next-door neighbor teaches English as a second language at Pensacola Junior College. She lets me come in and speak to her class about once every other year so that I can share about dinosaurs and also get the gospel into them a little bit. So I was sharing about dinosaurs, and I shared this session in there. This is all adults learning English from other countries. This lady raised her hand. She said, Mr. Hovind, I am from Indonesia. I'm a medical doctor, and so is my husband. We came over here to study English. She said, you are right. We have those creatures in Indonesia. Why do your American schools say they lived millions of years ago? Several missionaries claim they've seen these. Of course, some have never seen them, and somebody who's never seen one is going to say they don't exist. Carl Baugh has been down to Papua New Guinea several times. The natives there call the creature the ropen. They say it looks just like the pterodactyl, but it glows in the dark just a little bit, like it has something bioluminescent on its skin. Several missionaries have said they saw this creature, and it has a slight glow to it. Charlie Knight told me he saw one in... Uh, um, Washington, near, near Spokane, Washington. Giant bird was seen off the coast of Alaska about a year ago. How many heard about that one? The 14-foot wingspan. 
A lot of folks on this airplane saw this thing flying right along past the airplane. Not past it, but it's flying in that region. And nobody knows for sure what it was yet. It hasn't been seen since, as far as I know. I have lots and lots of stuff on this topic. A couple of things in real quick here. The Indians out west used to have a story about the Thunderbird. They told all the settlers that came out, they said, oh, be careful of the Thunderbird. It's a giant bird. They said, what? why do you call it the Thunderbird? They said, oh, a Sioux Indian party years ago saw one get hit by lightning and fall to the ground. It took them three days to find it. When they found this thing, the buzzards had picked it clean, but it had a 20-foot wingspan and a bone, bony bump on the back of its head. That's where the legend of the Thunderbird came from, a pterodactyl. Here's a prayer stick in an Indian museum in Colorado, near Colorado Springs, and it shows the head of a pterodactyl. Henry Ford put an eagle on the taillight of his Thunderbird. It should have been a pterodactyl, Henry. The French explorers came down the Mississippi in 1675. They stopped off where today the town of Alton, Illinois is, right across from St. Louis. And they saw this strange animal painted on the cliffs by the Indians. They said, what is this big animal that you painted up there? They said, oh, that's the Piasaw bird. They said, what's a Piasaw bird? They said, oh, a giant bird used to live up in the cliffs. He would swoop down and pick up Indians and carry them off. But a great chief prayed, and the, the, the great spirit showed him a way to kill this bird, and they finally killed this giant bird that terrorized our village. For years, they painted it up on the cliffs. When the white men took over the area, they kept the painting up there, kept painting the Piasaw bird. They got tired of painting it, so one day they put up a big metal plaque. There's me underneath it. Huge metal plaque. And then they got afraid the plaque might fall, so they took it down in 1996. But if you go to Alton, Illinois today and look up Piasaw in the phone book, you'll see all sorts of people listed as Piasaw Dairy Queen and Piasaw Motors and stuff like that. The Piasaw legend is famous around that area. There's a Civil War photograph circulating around that claims to be people standing by a pterodactyl. Apparently the photo is fake, okay? So don't fall for that one if it comes around. But people say, Brother Hovind, why do you go around and teach about dinosaurs? Well, Satan is using them to turn our own kids away from God. Somebody ought to set the record straight, folks. Christians are confused about where they fit in. I'm just trying to show you the Bible is correct as it's written. They're a great evangelistic tool. Kids love dinosaurs. And we've got to learn to use them to reach people with the gospel. And I think God ought to get the glory for everything he made. If Behemoth is the chief of the ways of God, then God ought to get the glory for what he made. The next chapter, God talks about a creature called Leviathan, another dinosaur. We cover that on one of the green tapes in our topical series about Leviathan. When God was all done talking to Job here, after four chapters, God apparently stopped talking, and Job finally answered the Lord. And he said, I know that thou canst do everything. Hey, did you know God can do everything? And why do we worry about things anyway, hmm? And he, Job said, No thought can be withholden from thee. Job said, I heard of you, but now I, I understand. I don't think any of us realize who God is. You know, we hear a little bit about him, but man, he's incredible. Job finally got to understand. He said, I repent in dust and ashes. Lord, I'm sorry. Question, how big is your God? Ever thought about that? Is your God big enough to tell you what kind of clothes to wear? The Bible says women should dress modestly. If you're not in business, don't advertise. Does your God tell you how to cut your hair? Man, when I got saved, I was a lifeguard. Long, blonde hair. I read the verse. It says it's a shame for man to have long hair. So I said, okay, God, I'll go cut it. Doesn't matter to me what anybody thinks. I want, I want to know what you care about, and I'm going to do it that way. Does God tell you what kind of speech to have? The Bible says... Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I know a lot, a lot of Christians need to work on cleaning up their mouth. Every idle word you're going to give account thereof in the day of judgment, the Bible says. Does God tell you what to watch on TV? Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Do you put wicked things before your eyes? God tell you what kind of music to listen to? He told us to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. See, Christians are supposed to be different from the world, folks. And I, for one, am sick and tired of the devil using God's creatures to turn people away from God. I think we need some Christians to get busy and do something for the Lord. People ask me this question all the time. Brother Hovind, did God call you to do this? 
I don't know. I never got a letter or a phone call. But it sure needs to be done. It just needs to be done. Look, if I tell my kids, clean your room, I don't want to come back an hour later and find them playing around and the job not done. If they say, well, you didn't say make the bed. Okay, kid, listen. If I say clean the room, I expect you to figure out the details. Now, kids, you may go to sleep. You will not understand anything I'm about to say. Parents, you will understand. Mom says, son, is your room clean? Yep, all clean, Mom. Okay, let's go check it out. Come in here, right here. Okay, son, you see that dirty sock right there? Hmm? Pick it up. Now, bring it over here and put it in the dirty clothes. Okay, now, come on back. Come over this way, this way. Okay, now, pick up the other one. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Don't you see what needs to be done? <laughs> I think God's up in heaven looking down at some of his kids, saying, don't you see something that needs to be done? Start a new ministry. Start a new Sunday school class for left-handed, one-eyed people or something. You know, <laughs> do something. <laughs> There's a war going on, for heaven's sake. Find something to do. Everybody can do something. The worst of you could serve as bad examples, if nothing else. <laughs> but you could all do something for the Lord. Man, find something to do. Get the job done. In Acts chapter 2, there are many, many verses quoted as he preached to the Jews because they knew about the Bible. They believed the Bible. So they quoted scripture after scripture after scripture in Acts 2. The second great sermon in the book of Acts is Acts 17 where Paul preached on Mars Hill. He did not quote one scripture. The whole sermon, not one Bible verse. He said, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. And then he said, God that made the world. Paul used creation as his means of evangelism. That's why we call our ministry creation science evangelism. We want to win souls. Hey, there's some practical steps you can use to get the gospel out using creation. You can see how many people you can get to watch videotapes. Feel free to copy mine, spread them around. People will sit home and watch a video that you will simply never get to come to church, especially men. If they're sitting at home, holding the remote. <laughs> this feeling of power surges through their body. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? Now, come on, be honest. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Man, use video to reach them. It's a great way. Now, look, if you want somebody to watch the video series, you get all excited. Okay, don't give them the whole thing. They won't even start. If you tell somebody, here, I want you to eat this elephant. Uh, wait till they're hungry, give them a little tiny piece of elephant meat. Then they'll want more. And I see people all the time, they get all excited and they go choke their neighbor on something, you know. <laughs> Copy 10 minutes of a tape and just give them that. Say, here, watch this. Shut it off right in the middle of something. Then they'll come for more. Why don't you pass out some videos on your campus? Give them to your public school teachers. Put them on TV. Put some tapes in your public library. Many have done this. You can get videotapes in your public library. I don't care if you use my stuff, use somebody's stuff, but folks, get the message out. Feel free to use my material any way you want. Spread it around. We've got lots of debates on video, lots of other topics on video. If I say something you don't like, edit it out. Take out the... You, look, you have to learn early in life, eat the meat and spit out the bones, or you're going to choke on something. <laughs> Take out what you don't like. Please feel free to use it, though. You could have a dino night here at the church. Have a vacation Bible school where you emphasize creation. Teach kids something about creation. You could get a truck or a trailer or a tent, travel to parks. One guy saw my seminar, got excited, spent $4,000 and built this huge tent that he blows up with a fan, sets it up in neighborhoods and invites kids to come get inside and learn about dinosaurs. They love it. They have hundreds and hundreds get saved with this big dinosaur tent. Some of you, some of you could do that up here. Have vacation Bible school with dinosaurs as the emphasis. One guy got a bus in Australia, lined the inside with fossils and posters and charts about dinosaurs and creation. He travels around and just stops wherever he can get a crowd. Hey, come on board. Let me tell you about dinosaurs. A traveling museum. One of you could do that for a ministry. huh? You could get some puppets or some flannel graph. Build a dinosaur adventure land. Please do. Come visit ours if you'd like. We had 10,000 visitors our first full year open. They're paying me to come get the gospel. What a deal. We're having a blast. 
we don't really have a plan, but someday we'd like to sell the lawnmower once everything gets covered with concrete. That's basically the plan, you know. <laughs> Dinosaur Adventure Land. The kids come, they get a little license, and everything, every activity has a science lesson and a spiritual lesson. You can go to our website, dinosauradventureland.com. We're adding all sorts of stuff to that every day, to that website, to make it a place where kids will just love to come, just play games and learn more about dinosaurs. If the kids come and break a record at one of our events, they get their name on the record board and they get a $5 gift certificate with a famous president on it. <laughs> All kinds of cool activities. We're just, we're just trying to find some way to undo the damage being done by the public schools and the museums in this county that talk about evolution. Just think up some way to get the gospel up. Feel free to come down, visit, take a video camera, copy everything we're doing and do another one up here someplace. We like to see thousands of these around the country. We're not trying to build a giant ministry. We're trying to win a war. All kinds of ideas down there. You come see our Dinosaur Adventure Land. Okay, last thought. Um, figure out some way to reach the kids in your area or Satan will. What we really need is a Christian Barney. You don't need, you don't need to be very smart for this job. Get yourself a big purple costume. Get all the neighbor kids together. Okay, kids. <laughs> Robin, you'd be good at this, brother. <laughs> Get all the kids together. Okay, kids, we're going to sing now. <laughs> Are you ready? God loves you. God loves me. He wants you in his family. If you'll ask him now, he'll come into your heart. And of his family, you'll be part. Shouldn't they learn that instead? <clears throat> you know, to keep one... F-15 in the air for one hour requires 454 support personnel on the ground. Now look, everybody ought to be doing something. If you're not going to preach, at least support the pastor who will. Hmm? And if you're not going to go to the mission field, then support the missionary who's willing to go. I mean, don't you think if you left your country and had strange land and strange diet, strange uh, clothes to wear and strange language to learn, don't you think you'd want to get a letter from home once in a while with a $50 bill in it? I don't mean your electric bill. I mean one they can spend, okay? <laughs> Everybody should find something to do. We've been commanded by the Lord, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you done doing that yet? Well, then let's keep going. I spoke nearly 800 times last year. People said, Brother Hovind, aren't you going to wear out? Oh, probably. Rather burn out than rust out, though. I don't know a lot of Christians are going to rust out. I learned years ago, if you burn the candle at both ends, you get twice the light. <laughs> and right now, the world needs twice the light. So get off your duff and find something to do for the Lord, okay? Let's all stand, bow our heads and close our eyes, and let's pray. Well, this is Kent Hovind. It is uh, August 31st, 1993. I'm sitting here at the Antique Quest in Winchester, New Hampshire with uh, Sandy Mancy. It's good to see you again, Sandy. I saw you uh, back in 92. And Sandy is the one that saw uh, Champ. Her picture appears on the cover of the book uh, by Joseph Zarzinski. Uh, this was, this took, why don't you tell us uh, when it was and where you were and just a little bit about it. I was in Vermont, on the Vermont side, and my husband, when we weren't married at the time, my fiance and my children, we were exploring the lake. I grew up in that area. And we were just exploring the lake, sitting there, enjoying the peace and quiet. My husband had gone back to the car to get the camera, and while he was gone, there was a disturbance in the lake, and I looked out, and I thought perhaps it was a school of fish, and maybe a scuba diver or something, and then the head and the neck broke the surface of the water, and the head picked up in the neck and the back. And I knew it wasn't a fish. Right. <laughs> well, great. And some people said they, 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 I heard somebody told you that they thought maybe it was a duck. I think it's about a 2,000 pound duck. A 2,000 pound duck. When we were at the church, when you came to hear me speak up in, uh, uh, wherever that was, New Hampshire, Dublin, New Hampshire, you, uh, I had all my dinosaurs on the table, and you immediately picked out this one as champ, but you said it was a little different, what you saw. Yes, what I saw is the neck was not near as long, and the head is shaped bright, like a horse head, but the neck is not near as long. 
Okay, now, there are three or four different types of swimming dinosaurs that bones have been found of. There's the chronosaur, which has a huge neck, the plesiosaur, which you're holding, and then there's the elasmosaur. Uh, had a shorter neck, and the head is at a right angle to the body instead of in line with the body. Uh, there may be others, of course, undiscovered yet, but get that where they can see it on the camera. Um, I think this more. Oh, shorter neck. With, with a shorter neck. Or, or it could be that the neck wasn't all out of the water, too. Okay. All right, so this was in, back in 1977. Um, how many other people do you know or have you talked to that claim they have seen it also? I have spoken with probably about six different people who have seen it. And all of our accounts are very, very similar. So we all can't be crazy and we all can't right. be telling something that maybe we didn't see. But they're all very, very similar with the shape of the head, the neck, um, just the massive size of it. Okay, now you, you watched it for about how long, would you say? Probably from the time the disturbance until it went back down, maybe eight minutes, ten minutes. Eight to ten minutes, okay. And uh, you told me the last time we talked, about a year ago, that when it first came up, it was um, looking different directions, it was looking yes. around? When it came up, it was facing this way, okay, to me. And when it came up out of the water, and then it looked around, and when I did take the one snapshot, it was getting fidgety. It was getting a little more movement to it and it had turned its head to look over its back and that's when I got the snapshot and then it turned and then it went down and it started going down like this and then it put its head down under the water. After it was completely under the water, I heard a boat coming. I heard a boat. Mm -hmm. Never didn't even see the boat, but I heard it coming. It knew that boat was coming long before my sense of hearing picked it up. Hmm. A lot of people I've interviewed have told me that, uh, like the ones in Africa, the dinosaurs in Africa, they'll, the natives claim they have very sensitive hearing, and they'll hear you coming and duck under the water. Mm -hmm. I've got missionary friends over there that say there are dinosaurs in that swamp. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. God created one. He created many. Sure. And this is something that has to be of creation. It's not, it's not something that could have come from the eel or any of that nonsense. And if God can create one, he can create many. Sure, right. Now, your, your picture has, uh, as well as being on the cover of Joseph's book, has been in a number of places. It was in Time Magazine, mm -hmm. uh, it was July 81, I think. Yes. You were on Unsolved Mysteries, did you say this last week? Or? Uh, Unsolved Mysteries has shown three times. Um, the first was September last year, and then Maybe September '92. Right. Okay. And, and then um, recently, about a week or so ago, they had a rerun of it. Oh, okay. So you're a movie star now. No. <laughs> well, there are those who teach that evolution is a proven fact. The dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. I, as you know, am very different. I was a scientist, science teacher, for 15 years. I'm of the strong, studied opinion that uh, a few dinosaurs are even still alive. The world isn't millions of years old. Would you say that what you saw was best described as being a dinosaur of some kind, water dwelling? I saw a dinosaur. You felt like you were seeing a dinosaur, right? I know. Not felt. I know. You know, okay. I saw a dinosaur. Now, the question comes to some people's mind, why did you only take one picture? Because I didn't want to miss anything. Busy watching it. I was busy watching. I brought the camera up. I took the one photograph, and then I put it down because I didn't want to miss anything. I was in so such total awe right. of what was happening, and I don't even know why I took the one. It was just instinct. My husband handed me the camera. He had gone after the he camera. He had gone anyway. after the camera to take pictures of the children. Okay, before it surfed. Right. Well, he it didn't even know anything was going okay. on until he got back there. Sure. And he helped me up the banking, and he handed me the camera so it helped me up the banking, and I had it. My knees gave out. I, I was shaking. And I went down on my knees. I picked the camera up. I took the one photograph and then put it down. I had a whole found. You could have uh, taken 20 pictures. Oh, absolutely. Right. But I wanted to watch it. And I was, <clears throat> and your mind tries to rationalize. And I'm trying to think, well, what is this? And, and there comes a point when you cannot rationalize. You just stand there and off. Yeah. Well, great. Anything else, any other typical questions you get asked? Or, most of the people that interview you are those who believe in evolution. Yes. 
And how do you feel about that? You don't like that. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. And I appreciate you letting me use your picture. I put it on one of my posters. Uh, and uh, I have quite a few pictures from different people. And my motive is to strengthen people's faith in the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. And uh, there's Sandy's picture. You've been featured in a number of uh, shows and magazines and things like that. And you're just, you've lived here how long? In, in, in Winchester? About 20 years. 20 years. So you had no intention of trying to become a celebrity by photographing Jan. No, as a matter of fact, I really didn't even want to publish. I kept it a secret for 20 years. And then I made them keep it in the scientific world. And I was I was forced by the media to publish. Mm -hmm. Because they were calling, well, if this exists, why haven't we seen it? And sure, right. So I was forced to, and that's why I had to, I put a copyright on so that I could have some control and some protection mm -hmm. as to who's going to use it. Right, smart, good move. Now, people have asked me, they say, hey, if these creatures, if there's so many of these creatures, why don't we get more pictures? And I, I ask them the question, I'll say, have you ever seen a car wreck? And I say, well, sure. I'll say, give me a picture of one as it happens. You never see a picture of a car wreck as it happens, and yet thousands of car wrecks happen. So it's when a, it's something that it's fleeting, it lasts a few seconds, you don't think of taking a picture until it's too late. And, well, maybe if you could uh, keep me posted, send me information if you get any more people, Absolutely. other because people probably come to you all the time, don't they? And say, yes. hey, I saw it. Yes. I would like to keep a file of that. Just send me a list. Absolutely. Send me a picture of the chance up here on the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me about the old gentleman that came and looked at it. I was standing here at the counter, and an older gentleman came in, and he's staring at the picture, and he's staring, and he asked me what it was. And I told him it was a chance from Lake Champlain. And he went on to tell me that he had never told a soul this, and he was in his 80s, he said, I think he said he was 89 or 87. And he told me about when he was a young man, and he went fishing with his grandfather up in Lake Champlain, up by uh, the Bulaga Bay, um, that area, up by Thai. He, he grew up on the lake? Yeah, he grew up on the lake. Okay. And he told me of a time that he and his grandfather were out fishing, and this monstrous big thing he said came out of the water and his grandfather told him that it was champ and that he wasn't to tell anybody due to the wow. fact that he would they would think that they were insane mm -hmm. and so he all those years he never told a soul about it he was, i was the first person he told and he said to me i was not insane my grandfather was not insane we saw a living breathing Right. And I was like, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> yes. More and more testimony. Yes, absolutely. Now, other people other people have seen it and they come to you and say, hey, you know. Yes, and, and I, I, I appreciate that because it gives me vindication. You know? I'm right. not crazy. I'm not free bad. You know? This is what I saw. This is what they saw. And we all saw something. And what? Someday maybe the lake will give up her secret. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But let's not kill it. Don't kill it. No, no. great. So well, thank you so much. You got customers here. We better let you go. I shouldn't have looked at it with the binoculars for long. I should have got the camera. Oh, 
way. He started way the heck out there. You know, that boy, just past that boy when that sailboat went by. I know. When I was looking at it with the binoculars, I thought it was just a log. It, just, it ran over, but it went right from that buoy oh. all, all the way inland, went underneath right in there. This is a giant squid of the species Architeuthis ducks. It came ashore on November the 22nd, 1979 in St. Brendan's on Collier's Island in Bonavista Bay, Newfoundland. It's an immature female. It is a small female, but it is a giant squid. I believe the giant squid reached an approximate maximum size of something like 150 feet. If this is 20 feet long, uh, well then um, it's uh, almost uh, eight times longer than this in overall length, and that's a big squid. In 1976, just 30 miles off the Lizard in Cornwall, two fishermen, George Vinnikin and John Cox, also met a monster. Well, it went steaming 30 miles off, 25 to 30 miles off, saw what I thought was a turned boat on the, on the horizon. So we went over to investigate. When we got closer, we could see it wasn't an upturned boat. It was something that, well, neither of us had seen before. So it was dark in color. And I had sort of humps on the back. I should say it was, well, between 15 and 18 feet in length. And rising above the sea about three feet. It was a flat, calm day. There was no disturbance in, on the sea at all. When we got up closer, a little closer, I came astern, very amazement up, out the water about three feet from this body, head, around, head appeared out the water. And it was a, well, thing I've never seen before after about 40 years of sea. And it gradually sank in the water and disappeared. But after talking about it, the only thing we could explain it was, a, was one of, very much like a prehistoric animal. And welcome to Ovi's Open Line program. I do believe that's what's going on in here this morning. Teresa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're talking about the Ogopogo uh, today. A lot of people in the, the area have seen it. The legend goes on for many years, and we'll be talking to some experts. I believe we've got Arlene Gall coming in. Arlene wrote a book on it. That's right. But well, we're going to go to the phone lines right now. Line two, good morning. Hello there. Mr. Puglis. Yes, go yes, ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, you want to know about Ogopogo? I certainly do. Yeah. Okay. I had a taxi and uh, I took the passengers to the hospital and uh, and then the, I was coming down uh, Abbott Street. And I got far as uh, about here. I looked at the lake. I was surprised. I seen this thing come out of the water. Well, it's like a, like a horse's head with the kind of horns on it. Oh, he was huge, you know, standing up there, oh, my, just like a, you know, like a big serpent. Then another fellow come behind me, and he says, what are you looking at? He says, I just see no Gopogo over there. And uh, he says, where, where? Over there, he says. I, I had the door open the car, and uh, stepped out just a little bit, and uh, he slipped back in the water, see? And he says, gee, look at the big, uh, big waves there. And all we can see is uh, big waves going down there to Fred's place where he had the boat boat rental, and they disappeared. See, and then and then I got all excited. I got in the car and I pulled to the willow end, and I told the people. I says uh, they were having breakfast. I just seen Ogopogo, and they says, "What the heck you been drinking, eh?" Line four, go ahead, please. Hello, John. How are you? I'm not too bad. Good. Are you going to give me your name? No, I'm not. Okay. Tell I me about saw, the... I saw Ogopogo off of Sarsons about four years ago. Okay, you don't want to give your name on the air. No, I don't. Uh, you've told some people, obviously. Uh, yes. Uh, are you afraid that they might think you're a little bit of a... Well, I had some strange phone calls. 
And uh, I get them every day. That's what they pay me for. <laughs> well, I don't get paid for them, so I don't really <laughs> want, any, want any more. Thank you. We were up in the beach having a picnic, and my daughter was on the swings when I saw this creature underneath the wharf there. And when I turned around and saw it and realized that it was the legendary Ogopogo, I just freaked out. I just ran, I grabbed the baby and ran down to the beach and she, I guess I yelled over and over, that's him. She was screaming like anything. She just couldn't believe it. Her face was red and uh, was fishing or whatever it was doing. And it was there for quite some time. Then it straightened out and went along those poles. And as it traveled along, it just the three humps were showing. And they were from one of those end of those poles to the other in the space the three humps were. It traveled along the beach till about the corner over there, and then it turned and went straight across the lake. All right, we're going to break from the phone calls right now and introduce to you someone that's well-known in the Okanagan Valley, Arlene Gall. Arlene has written a book on the Yogo Pogo. Good morning, Arlene. Good How morning, are you? Good morning, John. Morning, Teresa. Morning, Arlene. How Arlene. many sightings have you documented? Literally hundreds. Mm. Literally hundreds. When was the first sighting? The very first sighting was in 1852. The first documented sighting in 1852. Okay, 1852, and it's now 1980. 1980. Do we take it to uh, mean that there must be more than one Ogopogo? There definitely appear to be more than one. There has been a film that was made, and I think it was back in 1968. It's pretty hard not to believe when you see it right in front of your eye. Tell us about that film this morning. The Folden film was taken in 1968 by a gentleman by the name of Art Folden. He was returning from a trip to his home in Chase. And as he neared the uh, Peachland area, he spotted an object out on the lake, and he said to his wife, look, there's Olga Pogo, and she laughed at him. And he got out and started filming the creature. And what we see in the film is a large animate object moving through the water, surfacing and submerging uh, at various speeds and at various times. And it also shows the creature taking off at very high speed, producing a massive weight. And this is the footage uh, in the film that I like very much because you see a creature just pushing water, something terrifically, with a massive wake in front, just creating uh, huge wave action. This is believability on my part. Have there been any uh, recent sightings? We've had approximately uh, seven to eight sightings this year, but we have one uh, that has been the very best sighting. Why? And it was the Rieger family. Beautiful day. The water was just as calm as glass. When I just took a look across, I could see a big wave coming. And uh, at that time, I just didn't uh, take much notice of it. And it kept coming closer. And I thought to myself, why would there be a wave coming if uh, there's no wind or anything? So I called to my son. I says, come on back here. And I says, take a look and see if you think what the heck's coming down the lake here. So he took a look at it. And he says, gee, I don't know. So his, uh, we had his grandson, my grandson was along too. And he said, hey, Grandpa, he says, that's the Ogopogo. It would have ran right into us, but we had to wear the boat off alongside. And then it, we followed it alongside for about, oh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And I'd say the monster was possibly 14 to 16 feet long, which was above water, sticking above about three feet. And had a, quite a hump on the front shoulders and had a hump on the back where the tail went. And I'd say the tail was par approximately Oh, probably 30, 40, maybe 50 feet because we couldn't see the end of it. But he did have a long tail. He had four legs. And I'd say the monster weighed approximately maybe 30 ton. And, no. his head, uh, and his head in the front was moving from side to side. Uh, it, uh, it seemed like, uh, he, like uh, he was looking for fish or, or, or feeding or something like that. And, uh, he, was, uh, and uh, he was steering up a tremendous amount of water. I would have never seen it, I would have never believed it. And actually, I don't care if anybody believes me or not, but I, I've seen this animal, and I know it's here, and I know it's a tremendous sized animal. It was some sort of a, we call it a, a monster fish for lack of a better word, but it was approximately 30 to 35 feet in length, and its head was protruding out of the water, and uh, uh, you could see the flagell action of the tail and the waves going be beyond it. And uh, 
I took two pictures of it. Well, you said it was roughly similar to this. What was different? S similar to this. Uh, I couldn't see these fins on the side okay. because they were, if that is the, 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 the fish that I saw or, or whatever, mm -hmm. they were not uh, within sight. I mean, I could only see the head and the neck and like the upper part of the body. This is uh, Kent Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. I'm here in Canada at the 100 Huntley Street program. Several years ago, I think 1994, when I was uh, here on the program, I brought my book from Dr. Roy Mackle, uh, A Living Dinosaur, and uh, Cal, who's sitting here beside me, uh, Bombay said, uh, as we, he, was, he said, well, I was in Africa and I saw something like that, a dinosaur. And I turned to this page, page 256 in uh, Roy Mackle's book, and uh, Cal, you said, hey, I saw one of those. Would you take just a few minutes and tell the folks what you saw and, you know, where you work and if they can get a hold of you for any questions and tell, just describe what you saw. Well, it was, it, was, it was probably one of the most startling experiences I've ever had. It was about uh, in 1963, I think, and I was on my way through the old roads of Kenya back to Nairobi to pick up a car. So I was taking this old Chevrolet that was almost too big for those roads for the potholes. And I was going rather slow. And it was a hilly country in, near a place called Muharoni. And uh, that's down in the Rift Valley, but a hilly part of the Rift Valley. As we came up over the brow of the hill, my wife was with me. And suddenly laying there in front of us, right across the road, seven, eight, nine feet long, uh, was what I thought at first was a, a crocodile. And I thought, no, it can't be a crocodile. This is a dry part of the country. And then as I looked at it, we slowed down and stopped the car, actually, and, and stood and sat there for ten minutes looking at this. And as I looked at it, I, I thought, this, this is... I mean, the actual word prehistoric went through my mind. I said, this can't be real. I've seen pictures like this, but not quite like this one. Anyway, from the tail right through to the back of its head were, were uh, I don't know what you call them. Serrations, ridges. Ridges, uh, ridges, yeah. like triangulars, perfectly, perfect triangles, all the way from the tail to the, to the, for the head to the tail. And it was just laying squatted down on the road, seeming to sun. And uh, so I, I, I looked at the thing for 10 minutes. I'd, I could shoot myself for not having my camera with me that day, right. but I wish I had. But there it was, and I, I had never seen anything like it and nor before nor since. And I've asked people. In fact, I went to the Natural Museum and said, have you ever seen anything or heard of anything in Kenya of this nature? And they said, no, there's nothing like that alive today. I said, I saw something. And I, I argued with them really rather intently for a while, and they said, well, it must have been a figment of your imagination. Well, my, my wife and I both saw it, and we, we asked for several years, we asked anybody if they'd ever seen anything like that. Nobody had, nor had I, have I since. But there it was, laying on the road. After about 10 minutes, it stood up, not quite as high as, as this drawing, but uh, it just kind of wandered off into a very dry, dry part of the country, bushy a little bit, not much greenery. It was a dry time of the year, and it just took off. And Mary and I just kind of looked at each other in wonder, saying, what in the world is this thing? What, what color was it? It was kind of dusty gray. Okay. The, Could you see the eyes? Yeah. They, they'd blink. In fact, it turned its head and looked at, looked at us. You know, it, it didn't seem to be afraid of us. Could you tell from the pupil of the eyeball, was it slotted or round? I, like, I or couldn't you see that? I, Not that close? I, I don't think I was close enough to see that. Was the shape of the snout like a crocodile? Would more, you say? more like a crocodile than a, than a hippo, say. Okay, yeah, sure. It had a, it had a long uh, face. Now, uh, some of the African people I asked, uh, they said, oh, that was a monitor lizard. Well, I said, impossible. I've seen many monitor lizards. I've never seen one nine feet long. Right. Never as long as that. And I've actually killed a couple of monitor lizards with my car. And uh, they're smooth-skinned and no ridges in the back. I know a monitor lizard when I see one. This was not a monitor lizard. This had those uh, ridges down its back. Could you tell if it had smooth skin or scales? It looked, it looked kind of bumpy, more like an alligator. Right, okay. Uh, uh, on the sides. Mm -hmm. I don't think it had scales. <coughs> okay. I, I can't really be sure. Uh, All right, I mean, well. It, it's been a lot of years ago. It's nine, six, I mean, this is 1997. I well, I've been saying for years there's a few dinosaurs still alive, mm -hmm. and your first thought in your mind was something prehistoric, huh? Well, of course, I've been pre, I, I have been preconditioned by all the education that I'd had up till that time right. that yeah. these things don't exist. Whatever it is, it can't be a dinosaur. That's the yeah. first thought most yeah. people have. Well, well I, I, I considered it had to be some kind of a lizard. Sure. 
and because you know you have litter lizards from this size of the yeah. little gecko lizards right up to monitor lizards. All right, now you work here at 100 Huntley Street, mm -hmm. and they what's the phone number here? So if they have any questions, they can call and ask for Cal Bombay. My no phone number is area code 905-335-7100, extension 3206. All right, well. Call them up if you don't believe it. Uh, that's, I, I uh, saw it. I mean, I a lot of people. Still alive. Uh, when I saw this picture, I thought that's what I saw. I mean, it, all right. It, let's get them to zoom in on this picture if you can, real quick, and we'll close out with that. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to help. Uh, give us a call if you want more information on dinosaurs. Uh, you let us know, and we'll be glad to send you our videotape on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. So that's what you saw that day, 1962. That's All as right. close as anything I've ever seen. To okay. Well, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate the time, and uh, God welcome. bless you. You're Amen. welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching this videotape. Uh, for those of you that joined us uh, by video, we want to let you know that you're welcome to give us a call, and we'll try to answer any questions we can. We want to help strengthen your faith. On this tape, we talked about the age of the earth and what the Garden of Eden was like. Uh, it's interesting to learn things about dinosaurs and about creation and evolution, but it's much more important to know that you personally are going to heaven. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, or if you're not sure you're going to heaven, let me share with you very quickly and simply what the Bible says about how to go to heaven. You don't have to do what God says, but you at least ought to know what's going on and know what you need to do. When I was a sophomore in high school in East Peoria, Illinois, I had been raised in a variety of different churches, but I had never, I didn't know if I was going to heaven. I didn't know if I had ever trusted Christ. I wasn't saved. And a friend of mine asked me, he said, Kent, do you know if you're going to heaven? I said, no, I sure don't. He said, well, if I could take the Bible and show you what the Bible says, would you be interested in, in knowing? I said, yeah, I'd like to know about that. So he took his Bible and showed me three simple verses, and for the first time in my life, I understood what God wanted. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 3, in verse number 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody is a sinner. My friend looked at me and said, Kent, you are a sinner. You've done things that God doesn't like. I said, boy, you can say that again. And the Bible says everyone is a sinner. Now, some are worse than others in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, one sin makes you a sinner. And you're in trouble. If you've, committed, if you've broken one of God's laws, you're guilty, you're a sinner. Now, in Romans chapter 6, in verse number 23, it tells us, For the wages of sin is death. Of course, wages is something you earn, and wages of sin, what you have earned because of your sin is you have earned the death penalty. You deserve to die and go to hell. The problem is God doesn't want you to go to hell. So to be fair, God has to send everybody to hell because of one sin, but he decided to provide a way out. Jesus Christ came down and died on the cross to pay for your sins, and now you can accept what he did for you. So actually, his death pays for your sin. So my friend showed me the wages of sin is death. He said, can't you deserve to die and go to hell? I said, yeah, I know that. He said, but, the verse continues, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You do not get eternal life through the church. You don't get it through baptism. You don't get it through being good. You get eternal life through Jesus Christ. See, you received and I received, from, we received from our parents a free gift of physical life. Somebody else did the work, went through the pain, paid all the bills, and you and I got free gift, physical life. Getting born really only takes a few minutes. Now, growing takes a long time. And getting born into God's family only takes a few minutes. Growing in God's family takes a long time and requires a lot of effort, like reading your Bible, going to church, praying, doing those things. They help you grow to be a good Christian but they don't make you a Christian. You only become a Christian if somebody else does the work for you, if Jesus Christ comes and lives in your heart and makes you a new person. February 9, 1969, my friend said, Kent, you're a sinner. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, according to the Bible, you deserve to die and go to hell. I said, yes, sir, I know that too. He said, but God wants to give you a gift, eternal life. You deserve eternal death. God wants to give you eternal life. I said, well, how do I get it? He said, watch this. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13 tells us, for, the way, for whosoever, whosoever means anybody, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says you shall be saved. Anybody that receives Jesus Christ, they call on him. They ask him to forgive them. 
The Bible says in John chapter 1 that if you receive him, you become a child of God. You become a son of God. In John chapter 3, it says you must be born again. These things all tie together. When you receive Christ as your Savior, some people use the expression, you receive him into your heart. When you receive Jesus Christ, when you accept what he has done for you, you become a child of God. You receive the new birth. It just takes a few minutes to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? And so February 9th, 1969, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know you died for me on the cross. And I'd like you to forgive me. I'd like you to come live in my heart and save me and forgive me. Make a new person out of me, would you please, Lord? I just received Christ as my Savior. And so that day became my spiritual birthday into God's family. I'm now a child of God. Have been for quite a while. And if I do something wrong, I cannot go to hell because I've received the gift of eternal life, and eternal life lasts forever. But as God's child, I can receive his punishment. See, I'm in God's family now, and it's treated very different, a family matter, if I do some sin. Whereas before, I would have been, uh, God would have been my judge. It was a legal matter uh, if I had sinned. But now my sins are paid for. So when I tell people I'm going to heaven, it's not because I'm so good. It's because my sins are forgiven. You can have the same thing. If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Savior right now, he'll forgive your sin and save you and take you to heaven. In this session, we talk about creation and evolution and dinosaurs and carbon dating and all those things that are interesting. But it's not going to matter if you go to hell. Please, check your heart. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, why don't you ask him to save you right now? Just bow your head and pray a simple prayer like I prayed in 1969. You can, oh, there's no magic words. God knows what's in your heart. But if you'd like to receive Christ, why don't you pray something like this along with me? Just pray and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me on the cross. And I'd like to ask you to forgive me. I now receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, Romans 10.13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just receive Christ, you've got God's promise. You're going to heaven. And God's promises last forever. So if you've just done that, why don't you call or write or email me and let me know. My name and address will come up on the screen and you can get a hold of me and let me know. You just received Christ as your Savior and we can rejoice with you. Once you receive Christ, now that makes you born into God's family. That's just the beginning. Growing requires a lot of work. You're going to need to read your Bible, go to a good Bible-believing church, Start telling others about Jesus, and there's all sorts of things. And I'll be glad to be a help if I can be. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy this video series. What you're about to hear is an audio tape made of apparently the roaring of the creature in the Congo swamp the natives call Mokele Mbembe, uh, which would be one of the few living dinosaurs. The sound appears to have a flapping or slapping sound near the end of each roar. Some have speculated that this may be similar to the gecko lizard that uh, makes a little roaring sound and then the flap of skin under its throat slaps back against the throat, making the slapping sound. That's the best uh, so far we have on this. If you hear any more, please let me know. I hope you enjoy it. (laughs) 